Thank you for tuning into the Seabros Fishing Podcast. On this episode, Captain Damon Sacco of Castafari Sport Fishing returns for his fourth annual podcast with us. Damon is a pleasure to talk to and, as always, has great stories to share. In this conversation, we start off with some experiences with seasickness, both our own personal stories and with guests aboard. We move on to discuss tournament fishing, logistical challenges in running a large offshore fishing tournament, and some recent controversy Damon has had in his own tournaments. We also talk about the use of new sonar technologies and whether or not we think they should be allowed in specific events. Damon tells stories about fishing south of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket on the draggers this past fishing season, hand-feeding giant bluefin over 800 pounds. We also discuss traveling to fish across the globe. Damon does a lot of traveling as an angler to target new species using tactics that he doesn't get to use a lot in his own local waters. He talks about his prep for an upcoming trip that he has planned to the Maldives, targeting dogtooth tuna, big jacks, and many other species. Finally, we spend a bit of time talking about the upcoming 2024 Castafari Offshore Fishing Seminar, which is March 2nd and 3rd at the Marriott in Quincy, Massachusetts. It's always an educational and exciting event to attend, and Damon talks about some of the new presentations on tap for this year's event and mentions some legendary captains and fishermen that will be speaking. This is a great conversation. Damon's always a pleasure to have, have in the podcast studio, and uh, as always, we, w- we learned a lot and shared a lot of laughs, so we hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Captain Damon Sacco of Castafari Sport Fishing. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. So Emily was in Texas with uh, my daughter for like four days, and uh, my I was with my my son was home with me. Yeah, and she was just going for like a baby shower, and uh, my son got sick, so he's like throwing up and stuff, and then he was fine for like a whole day, and then I get on the phone with her. And uh, I'm like talking about like what happened. This is later at night after her baby shower, after the baby shower she went to. And uh, I'm like talking to her on the phone and she's like talking to Wyatt, like FaceTiming. And all of a sudden he just projectile throws up oh, on the lens? basically on my face while, oh. I'm, while I'm FaceTiming her. Ah. Uh, oh, that's priceless. Yeah. That's when you want to be recording. I know. Oh my when God. It's pretty funny. Wyatt basically projectile threw up in my Bring face while memories. i was facetiming emily i was in match and then hunter you see that video back on the day i have seen the video yeah that one's pretty bad i don't know why this keeps slouching down my daughter puked on my lap when i was i was on a spirit airline flight to uh <laughs> to fort lauderdale and she was sitting right next to me and she like hurled all she I, I i saw her getting sick too and i'm like let me get the bag honey hold on and she just was like nope right in my lap and I had shorts on, and I could feel the puke. Like, it went down into my socks. Oh, my God. And so God. the flight attendant's standing there, like, with a huge pile of paper towels, just handing me one after another. <laughs> and, the guy, and the guy next to me, the funny story, actually, I forgot to mention, the guy next to me, who was inside of her, he was on a window seat, he was with his wife, and I had my son with me. And they, these the kids are really young at this point. And, the, and, and, the, and I asked the guy, hey, man, do you mind, like, trading the window seat from, with my son? He's by himself. And, and, he, and he was with his wife. And he goes, no. And he wouldn't let me. What an get, ass. Yeah. And his wife was like, oh. She's like, I am so sorry. I was like, don't worry about it. And then, and then I'm like, payback's a bitch, motherfucker. He, he sandwiched in by a mountain of fucking puke towels. <laughs> Holy shit. That's fucking funny. What's the worst seasick story you've had in the boat in the past few years? So I had a scary... Do you guys know Eric Johnson? 
from Green Harbor, doctor. Wow. He's a heart surgeon. Sounds very boat, familiar. Boat named Shaman. I'm horrible with names. He, good with faces. You'd know. You'd, you guys. Good with boat see. silhouettes on the horizon. <laughs> yes. I can identify pretty much any boat and who owns Boat them. silhouette? <laughs> uh, he's got a green stick. I know who that is. Right. <laughs> People know me because of my tower. I have that black, yeah. like, uh, bimini top. Yeah. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, I was out. It was like two years ago. We were, um, I forget who was mating for me. I think it might have been Anders. We we were fishing Peaked Hill, and this woman got really, really sick. And all of a sudden, she just turned white, like really white, you know, like scary white. Like I, I was worried about her, you know. And I'm like, "Are you okay?" She's like, and then I saw the shakes, oh. and then she was going in and out of consciousness. Oh, and I God. was I was like, "We gotta we gotta get her back." And and her husband was, and, and the bite was on. Like Brett was next <laughs> to us fighting a fish. And I think it was the the morning that you guys came down from the bank. It was like two years ago in the fall, and I was talking to one of you guys, and you guys got a fish that day. And it was a big fleet. It was all on Peaked Hill, and it was late in the season. Anyways, it, we were it, the bite was on, and of course I'm like motherfucker, like I gotta go. So I call Eric Johnson. I'm like Eric, what should I do? He's like, what are her symptoms? She's is, is she shaking and dehydrated and going in and out of conch? And I was like, yes. He's like. Dude, call the ambulance, have a nine one like have an ambulance waiting for you and get to the nearest port right now. So I had to beeline it back to port, like in the middle of a great bite, and, and we dropped this woman off. And the, here's the crazy part of the story though. The daughter went with the mom and the dad stayed. And he was like, Let's go back. Oh He's like, Let's go back out Ruth. now. And then the fish had sucked. Yeah. Did she improve it when her feet hit land, or was it like no, no, on no? The she went no, no on the ambulance. Like, like no, no, they took her right in. Probably brought her in to, and shot her up with like IVs, IVs and, and all that. Yep, hmm. she was in rough shape. I've never seen anybody get that you know debilitated from seasickness. I've seen the shakes, but I've never seen in and out of consciousness. I've oh, seen that's napping. Like next level napping. It is you know, yeah. is different, but. There's a term for it when you go in and out of consciousness. <laughs> and, uh, it's basically like you're fucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Time to go home. Yeah. Uh, wow. I mean, bad. I've been sick. I've been really sick out there a few times. Have you? Know? you? Yeah, back in the day, I used to get... Nick told me you get a little seasick from I, time to time. It happens in in the dark. It's always yeah. in the dark when I can't see anything. You know, everything's moving. And it's got to be pretty sloppy. But we've spent some nights out there where I... Uh, and I get migraines sometimes. And, and when I get a migraine and I'm seasick, I'm fucked and, and I have to lie down for, or I'm toast. Weber gets seasick. Yeah. And uh, Matt Channel gets seasick. I woke, Calling you all out, boys. I, I woke up, threw up, and then I was fine on, uh, whose boat were we on in the canyons? Larry? No. Oh, Rob West boat. Oh, yeah. Remember when I, I was napping? Well, it was yeah. also like 8 it was to nasty. 10, and we were in a 32 tote. Was that, was that during the <laughs> yeah. big game battle? No, that was in it was, June, I think. Yeah, it was, it was an early trip. trip. We got a yeah. white, a wahoo, and like some tiny tunas. And we had that miniature sword that trip. Oh, That yeah. tiny, tiny one. Yeah. That's funny. No, but I remember waking up, and I'm like, I'm going to throw up. So I threw up, and then I was fine. And I've had probably like a half a dozen times that I honestly think it's just from lack of sleep. Mm -hmm. and it seems to be always in the canyons from like 1 to 3 a.m when i'm like re-rigging stuff for the next day i'm like dude i feel like that's shit. A, that has got to be the peak like you know <laughs> highs and lows that is right. the peak low on a canyon absolutely trip. It's yeah that pre-dawn like prep for the troll that fucking sucks and nobody says a word people just heads are down yeah people are just grabbing shit where'd you put the you know yeah. and no and and then it's like you get a you know like you get a trip where it's like you know you throw some slop in there Oh, it's, it's like, like I just want to stay in bed. Yeah. I feel like that fog, that like low fog doesn't clear until you hook up at sunrise oh, yeah. or in the morning. Right. Yeah. You're kind of just in this like Red Bull stupor and like, right. you know. And there always is a morning, usually, not always, but usually there's a morning bite, which snaps you right out of it. You're, yeah. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah. That's a good point. I remember one time I was with Kevin Glenn and I had Kevin, Scotty, and I think i might have had galvin too it was like the dream team way back in the day we went to mont we fished a shark tournament in montauk and i ate some salmon pate oh that would make me throw up <laughs> on land i ate that pate and i swear to god like 20 minutes later i, I fucking threw up my spleen like I was, I was hard like dry heaving and and i ended up staying in the bathroom you can ask those guys i was in that in the bathroom floor for like a half an hour like in, in the fetal position and, and like just deathly ill oh yeah, that was that was probably the worst I ever had like sickness, but that wasn't seasickness. That was just what is what are some things that you do to uh, help with that morning prep 
that morning like awfulness when you're trying to get ready for the I usually morning just bite. kind of pull the covers up and stay in bed <laughs> yeah, and yeah. pretend I don't hear yeah, Anders or whoever's yelling at me That's to wake funny. up. Is there anything like tackle wise that you do or anything that you like? Realize? To be honest with you, I, you know what I try to do is is in the in the evening when we're breaking down for the for the night for to go on the drift at night is I try to just organize my shit because I remember the days when I would just take stuff and throw it in a corner or I'd have a pile like there's my pile because the problem is in the dark and the you know in the next in and a lot of people are sleeping on the bridge deck usually my clients and I, last thing I want to do is like blast a bright light on so trying to go searching for shit in the dark so what I do is I just make a, like a night a like a morning tray and just try to organize shit. That's like the biggest thing for me, for us is like trying to be organized. Yeah. You know, also having separate rods for the night makes a huge impact on how tired you're going to be later on. 100%. And especially with the sword rods, because that's what we're primarily doing at night. We're not really, unless the troll has been slow and then we're like, fuck, we got to try to get some meat on the deck. But usually we're just sword fishing. So we are use the two sword rods. We can use the floss loop and then leave the floss loop on the line and not have to like find it and clip it. And then, cause the other thing is you get a lot of algae on those sword rods. Mm. And, and if you're, you know, and trying you to get cre- ready for the morning, you got to clean all that shit off. And- the crazy twist you get at night yeah, and twist. then you're trying to put that in the riggers and you're constantly like flipping over your Absolutely. tip top of your rod. Just yep. clean Pain in the ass. A lot cleaner. Mm, yeah. Sure. We have two straight butt fifties that we use for for the sword rods and it, it works out great it's awesome um so last season let's talk a little bit about last season i mean we just came we just finished up like a season review for ourselves his last season i know yeah no but you well what a season though for, especially for you i mean for the bluefin fishery which i don't really get into until the fall but that was red hot all summer it was good yeah it was fun how were the canyons the canyons were there was one eddy and it was it was on fire when it showed up in July and my tournament was kind of the first onslaught of of fishing that that we had up here you know from like Cape Cod anyway and it was like it was an eddy that was to the east so it was out towards like I want to say it was like Hydro uh, um, where the hell was that eddy yeah no it was east of Hydro I'm sorry it was like it was out towards Welker. And that eddy was really the only gig in town all summer. And as as time progressed, it got slower and slower and slower. And by the time we were fishing, like in the tri-state, I was in that same eddy with, you know, 100 other boats. And it was a grind, you know. My my tournament is always, I think, the best fishing because I'm not out there enjoying it, you know. And I see everybody coming in with all these fish. It has been for the last, since you've been... Maybe it was not the very first year you started it, but from then on, it's been the it's best. It seems to be on fire. Yeah, on fire. It's yeah. almost like the kickoff. You know, it's like the yeah. blue water kickoff bite happens during the OBBC, and then we usually go like the week before. And I did. I went out there actually the week before the OBBC, and I went to Lydonia to check the eddy just to see if there were fish on it on the on the uh, west side. And that's out of range from my tournament, but I was hoping that, because it was a week before the OBBC, so I was hoping we'd be able to find fish and at least be able to tell people online and create some hype, like, hey, we went there, there's lots of fish, we just got to wait a little longer for the edit to get in, into range, which it did, but it showed up like two days in time. It was kind of stressful, actually, because I was thinking about modifying the rules, and I, you know how that goes yeah. uh, late in the game. So... But I did do a trip early season, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it wasn't set up enough. We caught a couple of whites. Um, we didn't get any sword bites. We did some drops during the day. And then we had a bunch of uh, tunas. And um, Tyler was out there, and um, he, same thing. He got into some tunas and maybe got a sword. It just hadn't set up yet, but I knew the fish were there because we could see, you know, we could, we could, I was marking them. I, I, they were down deep. And then it was like a week went by and we had nice weather. And I think that's, that's the other thing is when you get like consecutive days out in the canyons that are, that are nice early in the year, I feel like that's what that fishery needs to, to marinate is not a bunch of chop and slop. It needs like mm. three, you know, not bluebird days, but just not, not, you know, hard wind days. Um, and that's what happened. It was right right before the tournament. We had some really nice bluebird weather. And then it was basically on fire for like, I'm going to say three weeks because we went after the tournament. We had a really good trip. And then 
by the time August came around, it was like, good luck. You know, you're out there in the desert, huh. you know, beautiful blue water, no breaks because it was so warm by then. You know, we had a really warm summer, dry. Um, and I don't know if the no rain makes a difference out there because the, the, the surface temps get so hot. I mean, we had surface temps that were like, you know, almost 80, Yeah. you know. Wow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a good, good year, but not, I wouldn't say it was on fire, but lots of blue marlin around. Um, you know, what really sucks is they took away all the buoys. They took away all those weather buoys out there, which is a bummer because we used to fish those a lot. Hmm. We used to fish those a lot. Those had a lot of fish on them. Why'd they take them out? Do you know? I don't know. I know one of them broke off and wound up off of like Norfolk. Um, and that took an entire ecosystem with it. It had like four feet of coral built on you know that had grown on the chain um and and that was a you know when that thing was around that that was like there was skipjack there were blue marlin we were actually live lining the skipjack it was a lot of fun and uh it's one thing i haven't done out there is live line Mm. you know what it it's not always we've tried it i've tried it with pogies i got bluefin doing that Tried scup for yellowfin. Yeah, you get bites here, or there, but it's almost better to use chunks. I, I feel like out there, like we've never done great with with live bait, other than when we're trolling skippies. But the problem with trolling skippies is you get a lot of sharks. Mm. But if you're trolling skippies around skippies, that's when you get the blues. And so the skippies would be around those buoys a lot. I mean, there was always a resident school of skipjack around uh, the, that weather buoy that yeah. was uh, south of West Atlantis. I mean. It was like clockwork. We'd show up. I'd send Maddie or Billy up on the bow with a, with a spinning rod with a deadly dick. He'd catch a hook a skippy and he'd be like, come on. And then I'd have to like, you know, go forward so we didn't get spooled. Then he'd <laughs> reel the f- fucking skippy in and like Maddie would scoop it up with the net. And then I'd be like bridling it as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> throw it in the water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I'd be like, get in the chair. Because, you know, at that time we had like 130s in a chair and we were like full on blue marlin fishing. Mm, but it was sick. so much fucking fun. It's sick. It was so much fun. What's, uh, what's some of or one of your most memorable catches on a skipjack, live skipjack? We caught a big, we had uh, Eric Johnson with us, making him the celebrity today. So we, we, uh, we were out there trolling skippies and we, um, we had a banner trip. We caught a bunch of blues. I think we caught like, I want to say we caught four or five blue marlin Jesus. On, on the live bait. We caught one monster that was, you know, over seven, just a tank. That's sick. And that was cool. We got, and we got that fish like, you know, nice and healthy right up to the boat. Got some good video, got some good pics. And uh, it, it's just nice when you can actually bring a, a big billfish in and actually film it. Because usually I'm like worried about, you know, the things on its side and it's like trying to get its last breath and, and you're like trying to revive it. And you spend so much time trying to save the fish that, that for me anyways, I'm not rolling footage like I should be. Like, like mm-hmm. I almost need a, like you guys have a lot of fixed mounts. I need to do that. You know, have some wide angle mounts just rolling the whole time. Yeah. Um, but that fish, you know, usually we can revive them. I mean, once in a while we, we do lose a fish now and then it sucks. It's like the ruins the day. That's just big game fishing though. Yeah, no, I know. It, it is. It really is. But, you know, usually that doesn't happen. And this fish though came in all lit up and it was just, a, it was just an awesome experience. That's you know? sick. Yeah. Another time we, we were doing that and there was a dive boat there. And the problem with the dive boats is they come right up to the buoy and they tie off to it, and then they jump in the water. And they're, I know they're spear fishing, there's big eye, there's yellowfin and, and, uh, and wahoo. And uh, in fact, one of the guys, I forget who it was, it was a guy, a spear fisherman who, who charted Lou de Fusco, and I think Lou was telling me, the guy said, I, I, I saw wahoo down there that were like 200 pounds. They were, he's like, the next world record is coming up here. Meat missiles. Just huge. So I mean, so I mean, but that's what was around those buoys, man. It was like, and it makes me want to. I know we've talked about this. It makes me want to go out and like, you know, create a fad and like, you know, know. Yeah. put a bunch of shit in the water and let it marinate for three months. It'd be one thing if it was sixty-five miles from home and not, you know, one hundred and forty miles, one hundred and twenty miles from home, one hundred and ten miles from home. Yeah, it's even like, sixty miles. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Well, it's just like, how do you keep track of it? You yeah. know, it's yeah. like. And, and, and unless it stays on the surface, but then if it stays on the surface, it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a zoo, hmm. you know, or someone's going to find it and be like, what the hell is this, you know, and yeah. get rid of it or cut it. How was the tournament this year? Tournament was great. We had uh, 60 boats, 
a lot of fish. Fishing was good. We had a little controversy um, with the spear fish. I don't know if you guys heard about that. I didn't. I didn't hear you about You didn't hear this. about the spear no. fish? No. Oh, damn. Well, <laughs> yeah, talk about... Yeah, there was... So every tournament has controversy. I feel like there's got to be some... You know, it's not a tournament unless there's a protest or, a, you know, a rule infraction or, or, or some type of drama. Um, but uh, the boat Polarizer, they're, they're a, a boat out of New Jersey. Really good fishermen. They're, they're, they fish the circuit up and down the, the coast. Um, they had a bunch of white releases, and I believe they had a blue and a swordfish. I mean, which in, my, in the OBBC, that, that racks up points. The swordfish is huge because you, if you weigh a fish, you get a point per pound, and I believe they brought in a fish big enough to weigh. I can't remember exactly, but anyways, they were doing really well on points, and they, they knocked um, No Mercy out of first place when they came in with all their points, and it was their billfish points that got that. They had tunas, too. And it was funny, too, because they're like, you know, they're white marlin guys, so they, they had a lot of light tackle. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, you know, I could hear them. They were like, man, there's some big fucking tunas up here. We, we were, <laughs> and, and, you know, they were hooking them on the light stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and, or actually, I think they, they switched over to some big sticks uh, when, when they got into the tunas. But they just had one of those banner trips. Like, they couldn't do anything wrong. Right. And they, they had footage. I saw the footage they had, and it was just like they were in, like, a, a froth of tuna. Like way off the edge too, which is pretty unusual to see a lot of surface speeds like that. I mean, I've, I've been fishing out there 30 years. I've seen maybe like six or seven surface feeds and, and they were like in the middle of one. But anyways, they, they had this um, peculiar looking white and they called it a spearfish. And I went, 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 you know, at the mate and I sat down in the salon. I'm looking at the footage because I review all the footage. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's a spearfish. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. Well, I assumed it was a round scale spearfish because I thought it was a white marlin, you know, a hatchet marlin. Yeah. Um, I really did. And to the point where I sent it to Skomal and, you know, he was like, I think that's probably what it is as well. And But the owner um, was like, you know, I think it's a, a short bill spearfish. You know, it's not a round scale this is a like a real spear. Do we have short bills in the Atlantic, though? So there are a few cases that um, there are short bill spearfish catches. Hmm. So is that part of your tournament as far as points, or is that not even? Now it is. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. It's all. Sounds like a touchy question. Uh, it's all uh, spearfish. I'm, I'm on board I mean, now. Listen, I, so here's the thing. I counted it as a round, I counted it as a white, yeah. and they got points for it, um, and they went into first place, and they were they stood to win a lot of money. Yeah. Um, they they still won a lot of money, but they they came in second after all this happened. But they were in first place, and and uh, and and you know the owner George Robinson calls me, and he's like Damon, he goes, I, that was not a round scale. You you counted it as a white marlin. I'm just just so you know, you know, like that we're standing by what we saw. Our assessment is 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 a is a real spearfish not a round scale and i'm like i think it's a round scale george and, and we were going back and forth like six phone calls one time you know he was like in the middle of having dinner and i'm like i think it's a round scale you know <laughs> <laughs> so and then i'm calling skomal we're having back and forth so then skomal's like i'm gonna i gotta call john graves jonathan graves like wrote the book on spearfish and then next thing you know walter golett and every marine like aquatic biologist was was in this circle like just bouncing so, around the ideas. I'm, I don't want what the hell this thing. Was. I don't want to cut you off, but so yeah. so the does the spearfish? Would the spearfish bring him to the next level of points, or is it so? The, like, what was the no, arguing factor of it? It I had guess? nothing to do with the tournament. Okay. He wanted the Grand Slam notoriety because it's pretty very unusual to catch, especially in the Atlantic, to okay. catch that got type it. of spearfish. They got a white, they got a blue, and a swordfish. So they basically got the the whole you know billfish grand slam mm -hmm. in the atlantic um very unusual and so i get it they want they wanted to uh you know to to capture that but i just disagreed and adamantly because i just a i didn't you know i, I really believed it was a round scale and i didn't want to like back down from that and then have somebody i mean here's the thing by backing but if i did back down which i eventually did 
they ended up losing. So it, 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 if it had gone the other way, it would have been a nightmare. In other words, if I had, if it really was a, if I really thought it was a, a short bill and I counted it as a round scale and then someone saw the footage like Tyler on No Mercy and he saw the footage and was like, that wasn't a round scale. That was an actual Mediterranean got it, got spearfish, it. which And then you wouldn't count, have the, which didn't count. Which points didn't count wise points at wise all. Yeah. at all. Correct. Because it was only round scale spearfish. And I started looking at rules. I started looking at white marlin open, mid-Atlantic, and they count all spearfish which is interesting. So there have been other catches. I remember uh, Andy Lavelle, who you guys obviously know, oh, he, yeah. they caught one on the Christine years back and Frank Pitton showed me the picture and it was a weird look. It looked like a wahoo with a little bill. Yeah. You know, re- like, almost my wife's like a, caught one. a big my wife, valley. My wife caught one in Hawaii and, and um, <sighs> forgive me, I don't know like the name of the species, but there's like rare fish species photos all the time there's this there's this one fish and i've seen pictures of it almost looks like a dragon with that that really like tall long dorsal it's not a billfish short bill spearfish at least hers looked like that dorsal fin with a wahoo's head like black back down it was and we've caught round scales before you and i have yeah it was the drastically fins are different. very different like the yeah like the round scale and the white has a, have like a paddle peck mm. right a rounded peck whereas these spearfish have more of a pointed yeah. peck, and they're and they're just more angular. I feel like they're not as girthy; they're just real, you know, pointy and thin. And um, but you know, they they got listen. They you know, George saw it up front. I didn't. I was looking at a video and then sending it out to aquatic biologists. I let them decide. I was like, listen, it's mm. out of my hands. Whatever those guys come back with, we're gonna roll with. And and those the guys on Polarizer agreed. And and ultimately. The biologist, you know, kind of like agreed. I don't know how, but they came to the conclusion that it was a short bill. So, but wow. there was some controversy for that's them cool. too. It took a. It wasn't like a, it was like a jury. Yeah, you know, yeah. it took yeah. a while. That's a tough place to be in, you know. And I feel like everybody that that runs a tournament always ends up in that place many times. It happens. You know, happen. You know what? I, I knock on wood. I I haven't had. I like look at the lawsuits that happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you know, I try to keep a real level playing field, keep, you know, the transparency is the key. It's got to be transparent. You got to make people capture footage on anything they're not actually bringing in to the scales. Was it the Mid-Atlantic that had the big shark bite controversy this past year? That was the Big Rock. Big, big rock, rock tournament. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? And the, and you know what sucked for that about that was it was a t- the tiniest little fucking bite it was like a little make like was. a six foot mako maybe even smaller you know it was one of those little like makos that look like little monsters they're like all teeth and with a tail something like that took a little nip at the marlin and, and cost that meat eater guy. did a podcast with the captain and crew it's worth a listen yeah yeah so what did the what, what, what in a nutshell what did the, was the guy cool about it after the fact they were pretty distraught i mean didn't they were, the fish they were, die tail wrapped or something from what I remember, it was just an epic battle right towards the end of allowable fishing time. And it was like a charter, a local charter guy that had like a rotating crew, you know, five, whatever. I don't know how many days it is, but like these two guys are day one. These two guys are day two, yada, yada, yada. And um, like there was no like struggle, like as if the fish were being sharked out. And then they didn't even notice the shark bite until they pulled it they in. They hung it. I thought they hung it. I thought. Because it was underneath the fish. They didn't see it. I, hmm. I'd i have to listen to the podcast again, but I thought he noticed something small when they came through the door, but it was also like hard to see because of how the fish it. was in the I didn't cockpit. see it right away. Like when I saw yeah. the fish, I was like, wow, what a, what a nice. But it was, it was more with the rule. It was... Um, I'm, I might not be getting this 100% right, but like they're in that particular tournament, like they refer to the IGFA rules. To the IGFA rules, but the majority of the rules in that tournament are tournament rules and not IGFA specific. Right. It's like one of the it's, only It's rules. just for... Um, so there was a little ambiguity there. The, because correct. It's just for basically shark bites. Right? Yeah, and it didn't it didn't spell out the rule in the rules. It just said, said refer to, to the IGFA. rule, gotcha. from what I understand. Gotcha. Which IGFA, if there's any sign of a shark bite correct. at all, it doesn't count. Correct. Right? 
Right. And I, I've had to, you know, I've had to disqualify mutilated fish. Happened to Nick on, on uh, Opportunity. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, it might have been either last year or the year before. They, they had a, you know, just a bite, like teeth marks. Nice blue. Had to disqualify it. I had another boat that <laughs> the shark ate half the fish. It was probably Same. a big tiger. Just ripped the thing in half. That Those sucks, suck. too. Because you know? that's out of your control, right? It's one yeah. thing if you you hit a fish with the wheel, right? Mm. Mutilated. You, you know, you fucked up. You know? Steve Fernandez had that big Allison yellow. Uh, oh, that's half. right. That Remember that? Trumped. shark? Yeah. Was that the Tri-State? I don't think he was fishing a tournament. That was out at like Hydro. And there were, yeah. there were three or four boats that year that got into those big, mm. big tunas. And and, uh, and he was one of them. And they were big fish, man. They were like, you know, 200 pounders. Yeah. They were fucking tanks. Monster. And you know what? You know what's funny? I started thinking like th- those, I feel like there's got to be schools of those fish, residents, you know, for the season, seasonal residents, big Allison tunas that are down deep. We caught one one year like years ago with my old boat um when i had the lures it was like back in like 2004 we caught like 100 and i think it weighed like 138 pounds and it had the big sickles on it and that was the last one i've seen i know galvin got one and and there's been a few other boats that have gotten into them but they must be they must live out there like there has to be it's just not a lot of them yeah. and i don't know if they're down deeper I mean, walt galette's showing the like the biomass of yellows that we pick from and how it migrates and you've seen some of the photos of the Allison Yellows in the areas where they do go. It's like, there's no way they aren't there. Right. There's I think no it's, way. it's just like when, you know, there's small bluefin around with giants. Mm. You got to catch four shorts to catch your giant. Even 80 inches and 115 inches. Right. And know? maybe and maybe they're down, you know, maybe they're down deep with the big eye. You know, maybe they're just in certain areas. Maybe they're off the shelf. We just don't like, maybe I would love to troll. Uh, my, my dream is when I hit the lottery is to, is to, <laughs> is to troll to Bermuda and just, just see what the hell's out there. I know, I know Cookie Murray's done it a bunch of times. They, when the speculator, I remember the speculator came rolling in out of the, like a ghost out of the middle of nowhere. I was out at beach and I was the only boat out there. And I, and I see this you know, this tower come in from the east. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And speculator coming in. It was Cookie coming in from Bermuda. That's trolling. Cool. And they, I know, I you know, I know they got into a bunch of blues, but you know, there's got to be like big Allisons out there in the in the open ocean too. I mean, once you're in the stream, you're in the stream. Is the way I look at it. Yeah. You know, mm. I feel like the fish don't know whether they're you know what latitude. Yeah. You know? I mean, the conditions are correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here we get tarpon off Chatham now. Yeah. Tarpon off Chatham, white marlin in, 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 in the canal, canal the in the bay. Sailfish in the canal. Sailfish in the canal. The tarpon yes. uh, that I Swordfish in January on Jeffries this year. Oh, shit. Yeah, really? On a party boat. I don't think they caught it, but it was swimming around the boat. Wow. Jesus. There were tunas uh, seen like the other day off of New York. There was some Oofing. caught locally when it yeah, then it, reopened you know, for the new year. Who caught them? Do you know? I don't. I just know it was a, like a couple bites. Couple. Wow couple of fish that's nuts that's nuts yeah i mean <laughs> is we, it more nuts that they actually caught or or, or the fact went. that they fucking went fishing in January. right exactly <laughs> i mean i went in december and i thought that was bad but yeah fucking january <laughs> no thank you you know i i uh, i just and you know what it's it's just every it's i feel like that's the trend though it's like a later start and a later finish mm, agreed although you know what not with the t- Actually, I, I shouldn't say it with the bluefin, but because I remember like tuna fest used to was in June for years, and it was on fire, small fish. But then that went away. They, the fish didn't start showing up until July. But I feel like lately, I don't know. In June, have you guys like on the bank? Have you seen? It's been slower to get going. Yeah. This year sure. was pretty good. The end of June, good action. Southwest yeah. corner was good. The end of June, was there it? were a few fish on middle bank. I harpooned a little bit with Jeff in June and. We saw quite a few fish. Did you? Yeah. Well, all like packs though. There was no herd, you know, at least the, the day I went and, and talking to him and stuff, there was no like massive, massive biomass. It was just like pack Scouts. after pack after Small pack. Small packs. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You were just talking about- That shit is addicting. Yeah. You talk about like- well, I, I love get, to do You getting into point. hunting and like, you know how addictive it is. And yeah. That shit is like crack, dude. It's insane. Just that different perspective of these things after doing it rod and reel for so long. It's hard to explain. It really is. Mm-hmm. I watched the fish look at him on the pulpit. 
like swim under him and look at him while like he missed. He should have hit the fish, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he missed. And uh, there were like three fish to his left and one fish to his right. I'll, I'll post the video. Maybe I'll, I'll have George post it um, while I'm while I'm narrating here. But one of them he throws and one was kind of deep off to the right and when he misses these ones take off and it was like this one wanted to try to get with the others and in doing so it just like rolled like looked right sideways up. looked at him and just stayed under him like as he's trying to pull back the harpoon i'm screaming at him that the fish is still there, still there. takes a shit and takes off like being able to see stuff like that wild just body movements and behavior and Watching yeah, them go cool. down and get the bait and then push them to the surface yeah. and then, you know, blow it apart. And then you see a milling for a few minutes and then you get your shot and then they do it again. That's cool to see that, to get that bird's eye perspective. It really was. And then seeing like, just being up that high for a whole day in our waters, being able to see that transition line in the tide and where they like to feed in relation to that transition line. Yeah. Just it, it learned a lot. Like you see that line coming through on anchor, but it's a completely different thing to see it for like almost a mile in this direction and a mile right. in this direction. Right. That's cool that you can see them feeding. So you actually saw like bait balls being pushed yep. up. And then they'd go away. And then like within 20 to 30 minutes, you'd have them up. Wow. You know, soldier formation, digesting, whatever. Right. And then you have your shot and they do it again. And it just happened in and around the tide changes, just like the rod and just reel like bite. Just like the rod and reel bite. Yeah. It's interesting. It's funny how like, how, you know, dependent, how significant like the slack is with bluefin, mm. but not so much, uh, other than blue marlin, we, I have noticed that, that blue marlin do have like a cyclical feed out there, like time wise. Huh. Yep. It's, and it's, I learned that way back in the day when I was fishing the, uh, Nantucket Anglers Tournament. They used to. It was the billfish tournament back in like uh, late '90s, early 2000s. And those guys would all, all the old timers were like, "Yeah, they bit on the slack." And I'm thinking to myself, like, like how, how, who, how the hell do you determine tide out there? You know? Yeah. And then they were using it's like the trying Davis. to figure out tide in Florida, right? <laughs> yeah, up, right. Up, up, down. No, up, up, up. There's two ups today. Two ups. There's three downs. Right. There's, yeah. a cross, there's a cross <laughs> perpendicular current. <laughs> yeah. There, there's uh, but like it. Honestly, though, and they then they use Davis Bank as like a, as kind of the uh, the medium, and then and then you just add on or subtract whatever you want. But that's the, that's kind of your base. But there was a pattern with blue marlin feeds. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, especially during the moons when the, when there was tide ripping. If you could hand pick, I know Decavia talks about this a lot. He talks about it every time he presents it your uh, your seminar. But if you had to pick a moon phase to fish like multi-species moon phase generally we've had good success out there what right be? before the full right before right before the full it's it's uh for the canyons yeah for the canyons right yeah. before the full yeah it's just i i love uh, the full moon can be good too especially at night but um always good for usually good for swords um billfish love it as well i mean the blue mar we all know the blue marlin love the the moons but um the, for some for some reason the canyons just like leading up to the full I've no, you know found anyways that they they are most productive mm. yeah we get we get some good action you know leading up to the moon I feel like the 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 moon comes and then it slows down and then it's like it needs to uh, has a recovery period like after the full mm. yeah that's, that's I what feel we've seen really about the tunas around here yeah I like the new I like closer to the new moon though. For tunas for, for bluefin for bluefin yeah like leading up to the new waning moon. crescent yeah did you guys um did you guys do any like dragger fishing out around the bank did you pull up to we the draggers up at to, all we pulled up to a couple in october i don't think i i november went behind, i went behind a few no. but didn't mark anything or see anything excuse me know. october we pulled up to a couple but didn't see anything yeah over, over near like peaked hill um, or in the bay between the 900 line and the bank yeah on the way home we were kind of like they were seeing them they were seeing there. them yeah but we never like they were in there i, really I know people who, who who fished on you know all over the place i mean chatham was the chatham thing got out of hand because it was there were a lot of people that shouldn't be doing it there there were guys pulling up and like there was i mean i saw a ron's hanging from one of the birds on one oh, of the God. draggers, like God. literally swinging around, hanging there. So somebody casted a Rons at the dragon. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine like 
with it, hooking a fish. <laughs> yeah, the thing's just gonna sit there and eat. It, like that's not gonna do anything. S- to spinning it. rods around a dragger Amazing. in general, you're gonna you're, like, you're, you, you know it's not gonna be short. It's going into that net in about seven seconds. Like yeah, you know. But that was cool. There were there were <laughs> there were that many Ugh. fish though, man. It was like there were fish everywhere. I mean, we saw fish. In fact, one of the talks we're gonna do with the seminar is like the inshore giant fishery and like all these spots holding fish really close to shore mm. you know um i mean nomans had fish off and on and they, you know the word got out in august and it was but that wasn't the only time they were there and the word got out in august though and there was like i want to say there were like 60 boats on top of the southwest ledge mm-hmm. so you guys know that ledge it's not that big it's yeah. like i don't know 20 15 acres and uh it's only 60 feet of water and literally the mackerel there. I've never seen so many mackerel. It was like there was a biomass of mackerel that that, that just lived there hmm. for like a month. It was wall to wall. Kind of like the screen in the fall in December. The mackerel? When was this again? August. Off of Nomans. This was in August. In August. August. We still had it in August. Yeah, I'm trying to think when it left. Uh, October. Late September, October, that's when you were fishing uh, chapstick mackerels when I was in PEI. So you guys saw a depletion of max? Yeah, like, but it was also... It was not it a also depletion. also correlated yeah. to a northeast blow, though. It was 100% the northeast yeah. blow. Like, there was a bazillion mackerel, giants. And then the sand deals got mackerel. pushed somewhere. Uh, yeah, the sand... I don't know exactly what happened. We had a northeast, like, three-day, 40 mile, 30, 40 mile an hour blow. When was that? In September? I can probably Late September. I was away. Yeah, it was we right, had nice weather. You had shit. It was weather. right when you left for PEI, pretty much right before PEI, actually, right before you left. And it you carried, were nervous. Yeah, 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 yeah. About that's PEI, right. that's right. And then you had like some west northwest days or something. And it was good that. a couple days on the bank, and then it just the bait was gone for like three weeks. Wow. Yeah, gone all little tiny tinker mackerel. But we were getting we got our biggest fish in the year on like a seven, probably not even seven inch long, like it the, the length of this. Whatever this would be. Hmm. Tiny big. little Mac. Tiny, tiny, tiny Mac. I came home from Canada. I know we, are, we talked about this with Ben, but so I left it. We we're fishing like mackerel. Yeah. Yeah. And I came back and Ben's like, save that, save that. And it's like, what? He's like, I swear that's the size, dude. That's the size. <laughs> yeah. like, I leave for two weeks and my mackerel leave? I'm like, what the that's fuck? That's funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were tiny. We, we were, were fishing. We were fishing in the bay one time, and I and it was pouring fucking rain, like off and on, and we're everyone's inside the bridge deck, and and uh, my mate kid was out there, um, and I'm like, kid, we need a whiting. We we need a whiting. That's what the bites are on, because all we have was Max, and so it's like pouring rain, and kid's out there, and he's like jigging away, and all of a sudden I see the rod tip, you know, <laughs> so he's like, I'm like, reel it in slow, because he wanted to be like, I only get the fucking thing in so I can get out of here, so I don't get soaked. I'm like, reel it in slow, and he's just getting. <laughs> pummeled with a downpour <laughs> right and he gets it up and it's this fucking whiting that's like six inches tiny little fucking whiting and i you know i have this like eight dot you know gorilla i don't even know what i was using back then but we we zip tie it on with a little zip t- we used a little zip tie back then but instead of bridling it but the hook was so big that it like pulled the the whiting oh, sideways yeah. and like i remember him like dropping it down and i was like well it's better than nothing and it fucking came right out of the hand the bike came right out of hand. Yeah. So I mean, like you said, like you know, I, I ele- uh, peanuts, elephant eat elephants peanuts. eat peanuts. Correct. Yeah. yeah. What was crazy is the bait source was was like that up where up in Canada while it was going on down here. We were seeing the exact same things. I don't know as the bird flies eight hundred mi- seven hundred miles away, six hundred miles away. So the mackerel down by you were gone in, at the end of August. So here's what happened: that they they. they inundated and it's funny because the claw had mackerel too not, but they were scattered it would be like you'd be drifting and all of a sudden you get into them and then you drift another five ten minutes and then you get into them whereas nomans it was like you couldn't even get the sabiki in the water i mm. mean there was just wall-to-wall bait mm. um and then what happened was i feel like the mackerel got maybe pushed in and corralled and that's why the tunas were there and then they were gone and then the whales were there too by the way, so the whales probably had more to do it with to do with it than the yeah than the tunas, but the tunas came in and cashed in, but then but then there was gone. It was like a ghost town. There were no mackerel. You couldn't even catch. Uh, Tommy High was out there at one time trying to catch a mackerel, and he couldn't even get baits. Um, but all I, you know, my question is, where did all those mackerel go? Because the fish, the, the mackerel left, 
fish left, but then the, the fish came back and there were giants inside Nomans between Squibnocket and Nomans hmm. busting on bluefish. And so there was a little secret bite going on there. And I mean, that's, you know, shallow water, 60 feet of water, you know, abutting like 10 feet on yeah. a sandbar. But there were so many bluefish. And that's, that's why those fish are in there. Did the tunas go from like a herd on the mackerel to packs on the bluefish or is it still the same amount of tuna fish? Um, I think the, the amount of tuna fish that was there when those mackerel were there was exorbitant. There was yeah. a shitload of fish. And the thing is the claw had fish. Cox's ledge had fish. I, I remember um, they, were ba- they were bluefin from basically Muskegon Channel all the way to Montauk. Hmm. They were, and, and, the, and the windmills, check this out. So I was fishing the tri-state and then I, I, like I told you, it was slow. We, we got some fish, we got a bunch of yellowfin and a couple of whites, but we didn't, we didn't you know, you need a big eye to win that tournament. Um, and so we were kind of, you know, frustrated, tired, and, and we were just about to leave to go back home. And I get a call from my buddy Carmine and he's like, he's like, you got any bait left? I'm like, no, not really. I, I said, my, my drunk crew was Buddha and Big Mike and Jimmy. <laughs> they, they caught a bunch of squid after I told them not to. And, uh, and the live well was chock full of these giant, you know, Block Island squid. And I'm like, yeah, I looked in the live well. I'm like, yeah, I got some squid. He goes, get out there to the windmills. It, it, it's on fire. And so we went out, you know, three miles out, out front of the island or behind the island. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a fleet. And it was just bent rods everywhere. And it was out of the hand bites, like just so many fish, That's like crazy. stupid fishing. And it was like that off and on, like, you know, you just had to find them. The mud hole had had bites off and on, like they were just that many fish. Mm. Rhode Island, yep. you know, which unfortunately we can't fish unless you have a, a Rhode Island landing, landing permit. permit. And they and they enforce it now. Which is, you know, I guess it's good, but it's it's tough if you're if you don't have the permit and you get caught. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to try to get a permit just just so I don't have to. If I am fishing down there, I don't have to run all the way to New Bedford. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's insane. There's that many bites. There's that many fish. It's nuts. And that's the everyone's bitching about the prices, right? And you know, let's face it. I, I don't know how you guys did, but I, I didn't do shit for prices. I mean, I got maybe six to, six to eight were the highs, but I got like that that big fish that my girlfriend caught. We got a dollar eighty a pound for that fish. We were in the same ballpark. A yep. couple that were like 10, 50, 11 yeah. early in the season. We had one 12 bucks. Most of it was like four to eight that's bucks. That's great. 12 bucks, man. That's but it like was like a school. 80 incher, you know? So yeah. like, well, I feel like you get the same the... price for no matter the size. You know what? The small fish were, were better for me too. Yeah. The ones we were getting at the Claw and the, uh, south of the vineyard were better priced fish. We need more people in the United States to want to eat bluefin tuna. I feel like there's just well, a stigma around it and no one markets it. And it's amazing and you can do so much with it. And we just I think the need to eat our own to, fucking fish. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. The you know? buyers need to, need to, I think, find some more consumerism. Like, like, like right now, I think the buyers, the market gets saturated and the buyers don't have the consumer. They just, so they're, because, you know, they're making the commission no matter what. So they're not really, they don't really have an incentive to, to expand their, their customer base. And I feel like it'd be great if someone developed like an app even that allowed, you know, fishermen to, you know, to, basically broadcast to the to the consumer world hey i have 800 pounds of yellowfin it's fresh going into falmouth let's go and like every restaurant gets a push notification buyers i feel like we're not utilizing the 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 broker system effectively like the the fish broker system yeah you know we're not you know i I call red's best and and they're good you know they, they distribute all over the world but like if you want to sell you know yellowfin it's hard i mean i Unless you want to, unless you have an in with somebody, hmm. you know, or big eye, or... which is insane because you tell a few friends that you have yellowfin, they're like, "Hell yeah, I'll have some yellowfin." Everybody oh, loves yeah. yellowfin, you know. You leave a cooler full on the porch, pick it up whenever it's gone in less than twelve to twenty-four I hours. I don't yeah. know. Need we need to eat, eat a more gap. of our fish here. It's, it's a... pretty sad, honestly. I just think that there's the, the cons- you know I feel like the uh, the demand is there. But it's it's exploiting it's it's being able to harvest that demand to, to be able to find it and and uh, I feel like the buyers are just using their their connections that they've always had and 
They need to expand because the because the fisheries expanded. There's more fishing effort. There's more fish being caught. Um, I don't even know if you know everyone blames wicked tuna. I, I honestly think it's just the the fishing in general. Like the it's 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 just a lot easier. The flexibility of work has increased the fleet size. Mm. You know, people can work from out there now. Plain and simple. And you can Good catch a, you can catch a tuna with a pogey at 20 feet, three yeah. miles off the beach. Three yep. miles off the beach. You know, you anybody do you don't need in a, big a boat. You dinghy can do, can do that. Skiff. Yeah. And, and that's what's happening. There are a lot of guys out there, you know, just part-time, you know, weekend guys that are just like, yeah, I'll, I'll that are catch crushing six, them. seven fish, you know, a month, whatever. Yeah. Right. There are 140 plus boats. In December. In, in December. December. In one spot. Yeah, that was crazy. That's just like... Doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. And if that, you were to tell me that like 10 to 15 years ago, I would have told you you were out of your fucking right, the mind. world. The yeah. world is coming to Because yeah. like <laughs> mid-November was like late to catch a tuna yeah. or late to even tuna fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You get one around Thanksgiving and you were like a hero in your own mind. I remember you know? talking to Mitch Roffer one time and he was like, all right. He goes, I don't have turkey for Thanksgiving. We have tuna. And I'm like, tuna? What do you mean? He's like, oh, yeah, fresh caught tuna. We catch, we'll catch go out and catch a Cape Cod bluefin in Thanksgiving. And I remember like telling people like, some people catch them in November. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You know, now it's like friggin' January. I know. Yeah. yeah, you're not cool unless you call it in January now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yep. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Dion Children Foundation. The Dion Children Foundation was established by the Dion family as a way to bring awareness to rare and ultra rare genetic diseases in children, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy or LGMD. LGMD is a neuromuscular disease that causes progressive muscle weakness leading to the loss of ambulation and eventually affects the heart and lungs. Recently, the Dion family was faced with the heartbreaking news that their son Peter and daughter Maggie were diagnosed with LGMD and are battling this rare disease. The core belief at the Dion Children Foundation is that no child should be left behind. For more information or to donate to this incredible cause and family, please visit the DionFund.org. Wow. I'm still working on December. I fished one day with Rob West like five years ago. It was December 16th. We went out there, only boat, and we were marking fish. We were at Middle Bank. <clears throat> I don't even know why. Somebody told me they'd seen fish. Maybe it was like I heard a rumor or whatever. But I was out there with Rob. And so I'm like, I got to a point where I'm like, these can't be fish. They got to be like, like, like seals. <laughs> well, you yeah. the same. No, yeah. absolutely. I was yeah. like, they got to be like mammals or like, or my fucking machines like on a zoom mode <laughs> yeah. right? and so they're all mackerel, mackerel they're all gigantic yeah. mackerel <laughs> and so i so everett sawyer was out there i don't know if you guys know yeah. Everett. So yeah. everett's out there and he's trolling he was off of like peak at hill like like trying to get small fish and then he was going to come in and, and and giant fish at the end of the day so he comes in i'm like dude i don't know i'm, I'm marking fish i think but I, I haven't got a bite and and rob's like it's going to be dark and you know at 4 30 so we should leave at four so we pull up the lines and we leave at four o'clock and I'm just about to enter the canal and my phone blows up and Everett's like, I'm doubled up. Where are you? Uh, <laughs> so they were fish yeah. and they fucking chewed, but yeah. we were the only two boats out there. And that wasn't that long ago. Yeah, um, and that was the only day I fished in December other than this year. I, I did that one day. Of course I picked the day that like there were 140 boats and like yeah, five yeah. fish. Some of the surface feeds we saw in December were mind boggling. I heard it was insane out there. Like it was the, insane. The first day the was first day absolutely was silly. Absolutely like, insane. it kind of like nothing really was going on. And then like, we, I think we got one of the first bites the on that northern edge. The good in the morning. It was pinned. You could tell there were tunas on it. Yeah. And there was just like singles, doubles, just in the bait in the yeah, dark. Right. But as soon as that fucking sun came up, it was insane. It was mayhem. No shit. Yeah. yeah. Like literally. Speech. Oh, yeah. If you didn't catch one, you just put another rod out and caught another one. Like, yep. if you, I mean, if you didn't land one, right. you just put another rod out wow. and you're on again. But it didn't, la if you lost them, if you didn't have your fish by 10 or weren't on by 10, it was yeah, it pretty was much over. over. So it was a morning thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, were you guys, um, fishing like north of, of the fleet because some people we i heard when you were up there okay yeah. it was because i i talked with uh not really far north just the northern side we would, yeah the northern side we kind of you know coming from that direction we'd take a peek you know kind of work the notch up and then get just up on the northern edge of the shoal water in like 85 
Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I heard from a couple people that they, they had done better up there, like after the fact. I heard that. It was good. The two mornings where the, the feeds were crazy, it just looked like everything came from the east, northeast, and smashed into that shoal, and all the, you know, bait just kind of congregated there and hung out. And it yeah. was nuts. But there was still stuff, you know, past the shoal down on the edge. Just giants, all, sickle tails, all of the surface. Yeah. When, like, you're on, you're just looking around, there's just giants all around you. Yeah. I love crazy. That. I love that. Yeah, it's cool. The birds were cool, too. I mean, we hadn't really seen, you know, the sheer water, you know, right. white turn madness for most of the season. Yeah. So to see that felt pretty good. A little bit peaked. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I want to take a, a quick step back because we talked about it on the way up the stairs. And it might be a touchy subject, but what are your thoughts on sonars? <laughs> sonars for tournaments and... And all that. I, want, I love hearing everybody. I want them to be more affordable. <laughs> yeah, no shit. No, um, well, yeah, I, I mean, the sonar, let's face it. You can it, cut it. Helps. If you want to cut something out, we can it, always cut whatever out. Yeah. No, I, I mean, honestly, it's 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 a controversial subject for a lot of people because it really does make a difference. I, I am convinced of that. And I, what happened, I, I learned that the hard way. I went down to fish the Mid-Atlantic like four years ago. And I had Maddie and Tommy with me and we rigged for like, you know, two days and, and we were like prepared and that's a big tournament there's i forget how many boats several hundred boats but you know it's it's very white marlin focused um obviously and then you know we weren't white marlin fishing we were going to go blue marlin fishing but when i got down there i saw all these guys rigging all these mullet dredges and and i'm like shit we gotta we, we gotta start rigging more natural you know dredge stuff and and so we we spent so much time and energy like rigging up for that tournament and then I started seeing at, at you know after the first day some of these boats coming in with all these flags, and I walked over to one of them and and uh, the captain actually came over to me and, and introduced himself and I was like hey you know nice day How, you know where were you, where were you guys and he's like oh yeah no we just we got a, we got one bite and I had him on the sonar and we just we stayed with him and 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 basically I went I went and looked up, you know, on the bridge and and he showed me he had recorded you know the the actual fish and showed me like how it worked and you can once you get a bite on sonar and you're marking packs of whites because a lot of times they're they're in packs you can stay on the fish and you can you know instead of guessing like which way did they go did they go left or right sonar allows you to just stay on the fish and you can keep catching fish while you're releasing fish you're on another fish and then you when that fish is coming in you're on another fish and that's how boats like slay yeah. the whites as they they capitalize on the on the pack while it's there makes sense you know then they might not get a bite for two more it's not like the sonar is going to just tell you up oh, we're going to go from fish to fish to fish to fish it's more like you get the bite and you see the whites when they come up because the sonar picks up everything it picks up like all kinds of disturbance so it's not an easy thing to 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 use mm. i mean boats hire sonar you know technicians just that's all they do you know um and it's like anything i'm sure like once you have that mark and then you hook a white you're like okay that's kind of what it looks like it's kind of what it looks like what was my Correct. aim what was this what was that you kind of jot that down your log you know blue marlin boom and then but you, you can see that when you hook a white right and you look down in the sonar you see the marks if it's a pack then you know like yeah that looks like disturbance over here but that's got to be whites because we have one on. Yeah. And they're, oh, and they're on the starboard side. So I'm going to make a starboard turn, take it out of gear for so whatever. So it'll, it, sonar allows you to just stay with that pack. And that's a huge advantage for bill fishermen, I, I think. And, you know, and then I hear stories. I haven't seen this firsthand, but, you know, where people, I, I think Miles Daly was telling me, you know, you can, you can actually hone in on blues, Mm. You know, and he, he said it was a game changer the first year. He used it a couple of years ago. We were in Nantucket and same thing. And so when, when guys like that are saying that it that it helps, it obviously helps. The first time I ever used it was with Miles and it was unbelievable. Just watching the packs of yellow fins, it was unbelievable. And there's some, uh, in regards to blues on the sonar, that guy uh, in Hawaii, Brian Tony, posts a yeah, lot of that stuff. wild videos. Yep. A lot of it's underwater pretty, stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, Brian. I just talked to Brian the other day about mud flap dredges. So I was picking his brain to, to just ask him what he. I'd does. like to get him on the podcast. Yeah, it'd be cool. He'd be great. He just don't talk politics. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll stick <laughs> <laughs> his Facebook or is maybe absolutely we'll. hilarious. <laughs> or actually, oh, yeah. maybe you should. I just love his no filter attitudes. Yeah. 
Exactly. Says it how he how he thinks it. That's funny. Yeah, no, sonar helps. I mean, I, it's 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 great technology, let's face it, but it's just so friggin' expensive. And and like, you know, it's a rich man's game, really. Mm. I mean, who the hell can afford a hundred and whatever it is, thirty thousand dollar unit you know like for me i'd have to sacrifice like my galley to put a fucking <laughs> piston in there i guess like, body part i was yeah. like uh, well yeah. that's true that's true that's, yep. that's amazing but yeah i'd have to i'd have to honestly though i'd have to like ditch like you know the closet with all my survival suits like that would just turn yeah, into we don't a, survival yeah suits. that'll turn into my sonar uh yeah. piston right in the closet because it, it's you know it's a big device and it needs room to you know It'll evolve quickly. I wonder. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I wonder what it's gonna look, look like in twenty years. Oh yeah. Oh, it'll. Is evolve. it gonna be like plasma yeah. TVs that like they'll go down? You know. Oh yeah. That's what cost. I think. That's what I think. The poor yeah. fish aren't gonna have a chance in twenty years. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. We were just talking about underwater trail cameras. Yeah. For tunas. I know. You imagine. We're going, Brings me back to we're the going fad. east today. Yeah, a fad with a transducer a and then a receiver at the surface, and you're just like, oh, marked five and. On, uh, you know, southwest corner, hey, Mark 20 on northwest right, hey, corner. Oh, like, let's go there in the morning. Hey, Joey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they, they're back. <laughs> yeah. Time to go. Yeah. I know. Soon that's, enough. Yeah. It's definitely coming. I want to try to get some, some underwater footage just in general because we don't really do a lot of it. <clears throat> you know, we have GoPros and stuff sometimes on, 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 in, in, on the deck. But, like, it'd be great to just get, like, some hardware that would allow us to look underneath you know especially like you, know, you see those dredge cams mm. and you know where they where you see the marlins coming in and, and feeding or whatever it'd be great to have a wide angle lens to see the entire spread i don't know how you do it if you you know someone's going to invent it though like something that trolls almost like a downrigger ball that trolls behind the boat that, that can look up yeah and see your spread the only i guess the only thing you risk is is noise and and obviously tangles yeah, you know, but yeah, if it trolled almost vertical, like to your point, right, it shot up. straight up, yeah. it would have to dig deep, which yeah. would push a lot and of pressure. You'd have to have a heavy knots, piece of that's a right, that's a heavy piece of you know line, whatever the hell you're gonna use, heavy braid, nine hundred braid, eight hundred pound blue <clears throat> marlin. Let's have a blue marlin under the boat at all times. Cameras in all angles. No. So where do you th where do you think? Uh, I don't even know it, and. You may have already put it in rules and all that stuff, but what's kind of your stance on the sonars and where do you think it's going to end up That's a good landing in your tournaments? I, I've talked to Kyle um, about the tri-state and what his stance is. I know Montauk doesn't allow it. Hmm. Um, and uh, now this year they're signed on with the SFC, I believe, or they're working on it. So the SFC will have the OBBC, the Montauk, challenge the tri-state shootout the white marlin open and in the, the south jersey yacht sales turn so there's five tournaments right there in the northeast i think all of those tournaments but montauk allow sonar um i allow it i i've thought about doing so this year we're adding a small boat division we've had a big push for that guys with center consoles that don't want to compete with you know a, a 62 yeah. viking why not have a I tournament like, so i like that with big, so, big so game yeah. battle format yeah yeah the big game battle's been doing it for years a lot of tournaments the mid-atlantic did it so we're going to have a small boat division 36 feet in length and under now those boats can still compete in the obbc so so they if you know say someone has a 36 yellow friend they're like i don't give a shit i still want to get you know compete in all the calcuttas and try to win the tournament i mean cam crocker won it i believe two years I don't know if it was back to back, but they had like a contender, and and they won it, and they you know they had blue mar you know blue marlin catches and and uh, all kinds of stuff. So I mean you know you don't need a big boat to win. Obviously, does it help? Absolutely, especially if the weather gets shitty. So we're gonna have a small boat division. Um, but what I was gonna say is the small boat division will allow small boats to compete selectively with just boats in that division if they choose. Hmm. So. That way, you know, if you do have a small boat and you don't want to compete with, you know, lights out, which, which is a big Viking, you can you can opt to just compete with boats in your category and have your own Calcuttas in that category. Um, we'll have trophies for that category, Calcuttas for that category. But what we're not trying to do is segregate and kick the small boats out of the 
the big money. Um, we're just trying to make it so they don't have to be forced into competing with, with the big boats if they don't want to. I mean, it's a, it's a tough subject because the sonar is controversial. People have bitched about it. But I'm telling you right now, it's not easy to use. And the people I know who have it are still learning how to use it. And they aren't 100% that it makes a world of difference. You know, Miles is because I'm pretty sure they had somebody on board showing them how to use it and, and doing a lot of the legwork, you know. Mm, and it's if expensive. You, and it's expensive. you got to hire somebody to do that. Like, that's a full-time, that's like a mate. Um, yeah. So, and, and not everybody has, you know, funds to throw around like that. So, I mean... Um, It'd probably destroy my brain if I had a sonar. I'd be staring at it. Talk, talk about seasickness. I'd probably be nauseous after like 10 seconds. Because I'd be looking at that thing the whole fucking time. Because um, that's the thing. you got to stare at it. You know, from what I understand, you really got to pay close attention. I feel like you need to work your way up to it. Like you can't just buy a boat and have fucking sonar. Like Right. Well, you can do any you gotta, with money, but yeah. I understand. Right. But like talking about fishing and becoming a better fisherman overall, like I feel like you're just going to kind of do yourself a service. Or are you going to work backwards? You know? Yeah, you shouldn't be allowed to have sonar if you're yeah. just getting into That's it. That's just right? my rule. Because you're so jealous <laughs> yeah, of having sonar. 100%. I can't wait till Unfor this. Unfortunately, though, the, what dictates that is is income. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. It's like correct. you're allowed. If, oh, if you if you make $6 million a year, you're allowed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that is tricky. And it's the problem is it's, it can be solved with money, you know. It's like having True. it's like having a better it's a shame. set of reels. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like the guy with the Talicas versus you know the Squalls are probably going to be able to pitch at White Marlin better. Yep. You know, I will say this: we're going to talk about this at the seminar too. It's just you know the 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 um, the significance of like real weight. Tackle oh, yeah. weight and and how when you're in the bait and switch game and, and by the way that is a blast i we started doing it this year um you know just basically trolling dredges and some long baits shoots or whatever you like and and uh you know maybe something up the middle but like really just focusing on your dredges and maybe a couple of nakeds but like being able to con convert so when those blues come in or whites i i could care less about white marlin to be honest with you but i you know when you're fishing a tournament you're trying to get points uh, but the blues come in, I, I um, picked up two 50 Talicas, four pitch rods, and, and I'm having Zach build us some um, two seven-foot pitch rods. And you really need a longer rod for a pitch, I've learned, because it helps you kind of get outside the wash. Makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, you know. And, and, and so um, I've been kind of looking into, like, the way the guys are doing it, and a lot of them are they're not always using natural dredges either. I'm noticing that a lot of guys are using just, like, artificial dredges with you know electric reels not trying to do it by hand <clears throat> i know they're expensive the lps are what we have they're not cheap that's another point going back to the sonar it's you're right it's a you money know? game it's it, but you know what they're awesome you you, you set them and the beauty beauty thing about the lps is you can have a setting where like you hit the button and, you, and the reel remembers where to stop so the dredge comes up boom stops and hangs so now when you when you're hooked up and it's a fucking fire drill you get two dredges out Somebody all, you know, someone's job on my boat is just to hit the buttons on both dredges. Like that's the first thing, you know, just to get the dredges out of the way. Mm. Cause you leave a dredge in the water, we've done it. You know, I think I had your, one of the dredges I bought from you. It was like 400 bucks. It was like, go, 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 go. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you know, that was back in the day when we were like tying them to the cleat oh, and yeah. then like, you forgot about the dredge. <laughs> dredge, dredge. Very efficient. I see a piece of line down. Yeah. On the topaz with Rob, he would just scream dredge. As soon That's as a bite. Like, not like wood side the fish is up or anything. Like rods on. Dredge, 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 dredge. Just yelling. Yeah. Hilarious. It is so important though when a billfish comes up to get that, at least that side, out of the water. You got to get it out of the water. Out of the water. As quickly water. as possible and get a bait back there as quickly as possible. Yeah. And when you, my, my point was... I got sidetracked, but if you have a light rod, like a straight butt rod, like with a ta like the Talicas are, I mean, again, they're not cheap. Yeah. They're really expensive reels, but they're the best, you know, and and uh, they they are perfect for the pitch game. And so we're, you know, I, we were using 50 uh, Tiagras, and that's kind of a cumbersome reel to like 
bang around, especially when you have a teak rocket launcher, yeah. which also costs money to have resurfaced every few years. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you get like these rods being flung around the cockpit, but I mean, when you have a nice light reel, it's so much easier. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, we're going to talk about that at the seminar and, and because that's a lot of fun. And I feel like guys are missing out when, when, you know, when you're putting all that shit in the water, a lot of times blue marlin come up. We've, we've, we troll a lot of like nomad uh, DTX minnows. And those things are great, by the way, for tunas. The tunas love them. But the billfish do too. And a lot of times, we, you, know, you can ask Dylan, we had a lot of wax. where, And I think they were blue marlin hitting it because we'd, all of a sudden, you'd, you know, the flat rod would go boom and it would bounce. And Dylan would be like, oh, something, you know. And then like five seconds later, we'd have a blow up on one of the baits with a blue marlin and you'd either miss it. And usually they do because they have so much water they're pushing. They throw a spreader bar and they always hit like the shit you don't want them to hit yeah. when you're doing a multi-species spread yeah. Yeah. they come up on the fucking spreader bars you know and you see a like a wake and the bar gets like rolled over and then he's gone but the fact is they're coming up on shit like and hitting it you know or, or actually whacking it probably with their bill um but so that's the problem with having a lot of crap on the water is that you you miss the bites you know and a lot of times they'll swim away you know whereas you know when you have just a bait and switch set up you can have those fish following you, even if you screw it up. Um, and unless they feel the hook, then they're, you're, they're yeah. gone. But especially with the whites, especially with the whites. Mm. I mean, for us to catch whites, they got to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> they got to just come in hard and just. Those things can be so frustrating. <laughs> they're very frustrating, unless you have a circle hook, a small circle hook too, like a thin circle hook, and and you're doing it right. Like I was talking to. Uh, I don't know, it was Tim Richardson, someone who know who's been in the game for years, just to explaining how when you when you do, you know, set the hook with a circle hook and you know, in the troll game, the bait and switch game, you literally have to go like up when it's time to, to set, it's like click, 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 click. It's not like set the hook with the la with the drag lever, even though you're not doing this, it's the same inertia. Because mm -hmm. the boat's doing eight knots and if you just go up like that on the drag it's the equivalent of doing this. And a lot of times, you, and we learn the hard way, ask Billy, we learn the hard way doing that, but it's really just a slow click, 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 you know. You're just trying to get the line to set the hook. You don't need a whole lot of Pretty pressure, much. especially when you're moving yeah, especially forward. Especially thin hooks. Yeah. Like anchored, it's slightly different. You know, we go up pretty fast. We're also sitting still, you know? Yeah. Um, so seminar stuff. Yeah. I feel like we've gone around in this conversation. No, we've, been, up, we've been on track, you know, talking about the season, seasickness, yeah. tournament fishing, sonar. So a couple of things I want to talk about um, is the seminar topics, what you're looking forward to. But I also wanted to circle back to uh, SFC and how that, the logistics of that went. Your first year. Let's start yeah. there since we're kind of still on the fishing yeah. topic. Talk about the SFC. SFC first. Yeah, yeah, so the SFC, so this will be their third year. Sport Fishing Championship, for those of you who don't know what it is. Yep, Sport Fishing Championship. It's basically like a, a PGA tour, if you will, of, of, of sport fishing. Um, and they have a golf division and an Atlantic division, and they are expanding, and they're now going to have four divisions. They're going to have a golf division, an Atlantic, a Caribbean, uh, and... I forget what they're calling the fourth one. It, it, this is now for 2025. For 2024, there's still there'll still be an Atlantic and a and a Gulf division. Um, but basically, they they uh, they televise each each event and tournament boats. Like for instance, in the OBBC, it's optional to fish the SFC. So when you sign up for my for the OBBC, you don't have to fish the SFC. It's an extra en entrance fee to fish the SFC, but there's a lot of prize money involved. They they have a uh, they had a, a million dollar um, prize, you know, overall winner prize, and then they also have species prizes, big as Big Eye, which I think I'm pretty sure Gypsy got. Um, and that's fifty thousand. Then it's big as Mahi, fifty k. So they, you know, they mix it up, and so they create some incentives. Um, and the I, I think they do a really good job in in the way they they you know carry out the rules. Um, their rules are a little bit different than mine, but basically their rules are you have to follow the rule of the tournament you're in. So they don't try to change the, the platform of rules, but um, 
you know, my tournament's a little different than like uh, other tournaments because of the point structure. But the bottom line is um, like SFC has, and this is going to sound confusing, but they have like an allotment of points for a blue marlin that's different from my point system. So the bottom line is it's two separate tournaments, <clears throat> if you will. So their, their tournament is kind of a subsidiary tournament in the OBBC, yeah. also in the Tri-State, in the Montauk tournament. Two different score scorecards. Same set of rules. Same set of rules, two different scorecards, but here's the here's where it gets tricky. The they mandate that boats have to fish three of their division tournaments. So in the Atlantic Division, I think there's an August St. Augustine, the White Marlin Open, the Montauk, the South Jersey, the Tri-State, and the OBBC. I believe there's six events, and boats have to fish three out of those six to qualify. Um, the nice thing is you know, now they have a presence. First year, they didn't really have a presence up here in the Northeast. Tri-State wasn't involved. It was just me. And then the next tournament was down in like Florida. Um, it was, it, I mean, I'm sorry, it was, it was South Jersey. And then there was Florida. So it was tough the first year. Not many, I only think we had one or two boats that f- tried to fish all three. Now we actually have a, a slew of boats that are fishing the circuit, which is great. Um, and there's prize money for that too. So if you win the Atlantic division, there's, I think, a $100,000 prize. So they're, they're trying to beef up the incentives without going too crazy because they obviously try, need to survive and make money as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I guess uh, if I had to say how's it going, it's going well. I mean, they, they're, you know, they have a professional crew. They, they, their production's great. They're, they don't get in people's way. They put cameras on a lot of the boats that, that fish the SFC. Like in my tournament, I think they put cameras on all the SFC boats. Um, and everybody had great things to say about their production staff. They, you know, like I said, they didn't get in the way. They just, and they do a nice job filming. Um, yeah, their production quality is good. really good. Yeah, it's good stuff. But, you know, I guess the, the flip side of it is it, it does, um, it, it does create for me. So they, they, they were, were um, it, it creates some extra work because now you're trying to, you know, I'm trying to kind of educate the boats that in the OBBC on what the SFC is trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, because I'd like to see more participation. I'd like to see, I think we, we had six or seven boats in the SFC last year in the from the OBBC. It'd be nice to have 20 boats, mm. you know. But they don't really need that um, because it, it, I'll tell you, with a small group, it's kind of fun because you get to know the crews and the boats. You know, sometimes you see, I remember watching uh, ESPN back in the day, they did like a billfish circuit and there was, you know, some big tournaments and it was hard to, you didn't really get to know the teams. Yeah. Whereas the SFC, they're good about kind of profiling the people. Builds a story. The personalities. Less videographers, the smaller the group, you know, logistically it's tighter. Yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. And, and so, but they're expanding. Um, and and I, I don't know how they do it because they're, they're, they've grown, a, you know, think about it. It hasn't been that long. Mm. We've only had two seasons, but uh, it's cool. It's been fun. It's been a good road. And, and um, I'd love to fish it, to be honest with you, but there's no way I could fish my tournament, even though the fishing's the best it, it ever is every year. <laughs> yeah. Every year. Yeah, it's tough. Um, until I actually, the, the one year I decide to fish it, it would probably suck. And then I, there'd be like a riot. People would be like, you fucked it up. <laughs> yeah, you're Italian the only luck. big guy. Yeah, yeah. You exactly. got the only big guy. The only big guy. Everybody cheated. Yeah. Yeah, oh, so. Um, but no, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fun season. And, uh, you know, we we may come, we may, I may try to fish the White Marlin Open. I've always wanted to fish that tournament. It'd be fun. Without sonar. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, I agree with you. I think sonar should just be allowed. You have to. In these tournaments. It's the mm. same thing as any other piece of gear that you can spend money on and buy. Yep. You have to allow it because if you don't, and some tournaments don't, it it dilutes the, the prize money. Yeah. Big time. So now all of a sudden when you're, you know, you're stroking a whatever, $200,000 check, that gets cut in half. Yeah. Because now all the boat, you know, a lot of the boats who don't have, it would basically be like boats with sonar, Calcuttas, and boats without sonar, Calcuttas, and that's it. Why would you ever, as a boat without sonar, get into a Calcutta that Makes no had sense. sonar boats? Mm-hmm. But, um, so yeah. it's cool. Looking forward to that. Yeah, it should be fun. 
It's, oh, this year on the OBBC front, uh, I should I should mention we we changed the way in in Falmouth. We're doing the way in it. You know where the Flying Bridge restaurant is? I don't know if you guys are familiar with Falmouth Harbor, but the, there's a restaurant, the Flying Bridge. It's right on the harbor. They have a little marina there, and uh, we're going to do the way ins at the restaurant this year. And um, we've been doing doing them at McDougal's, which has gone great. But the problem there is uh, the public can't access the grounds because that'll of parking. be sweet. So this will be like bar, live music. That's perfect. You know, kind of like what the Big Rock does. Mm. So I'm hoping we're hoping fun. to amp it up. Yeah, and have like a happy hour, like a way station happy hour. You know, a bunch of drunk people. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Lifting heavy fish off of boats. Lifting heavy fish off boats. Right? <laughs> That's have, cool. I'll have to add Black Marlin as a, as a prize. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Speaking of shenanigans, <laughs> seminar. Yeah. March. March 2 and 3. 2nd and 3rd. Yep. I can't wait. Yeah, it's one of my favorite good. winter activities. It is fun. It's fun to break it up. Yeah, it's fun to break it. I think some people just go for for the camaraderie and, and totally. And, yeah, just just hanging out and seeing people they haven't seen. I used to fish the shark tournament back in the day just because of that. It was just fun to to do. You know, we have fun with that. It's like it's not too serious. I sometimes I feel like you know when I average when I market it online like the, that it looks like too serious and like rigging classes bait rigging lab and it's like you know yeah we do geek out a little bit but but it's fun you know it's like passionate really good time. about it yeah it's it's a great listen it's a great place to learn i mean nobody knows at all i mean i i learn a ton of shit when i'm there when i can when i have time we, when i'm not putting out a fire i can actually go and like watch you know i love listening to you guys i i love that you guys are doing a bait rigging uh workshop that. that'll be cool it'll be good you know but the, and, and just listening to like Walt Gallet talk about like the, you know, the science of bluefin and um, we're doing a bunch of new stuff this year too, which should be nice. You know, we're doing a bunch of new workshops. We added a workshop room. We have Joe um, Higgins. I don't know if you know Joe. Oh yeah, Fish I got a bunch of his art in the house. <clears throat> Actually, you do. You have a tail down yeah. there. I saw. Yeah. So Joe, Joe's coming. He's going to do like a um, a fish print class. He's awesome. Yeah, That's he's cool. He's like a wizard. He is. He's a really talented guy. He's the guy. He's kind of one of the pioneers of that. I he is. He is. I think he's, from what I can remember, he I know was there's like a one few, of the first people for that he's medium and art yep. around here anyway. Definitely. But yeah, he makes some cool shit. I've got a, got a thousand pounder tail downstairs. We had a bunch of prints done of that fish. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, he does it all too. He's, I mean, he's great, obviously the printer and, and all that art, but I mean, graphic design wise, he's, he's amazing. Some, yeah, Wicked Boston stuff. Harbor Cruises. Oh yeah, he's had them as a client for a long time. So yeah, he's gonna be there. Um, we're gonna do. Uh, we we have a bunch of like workshops. So I have a whole new workshop room. It's it's a much smaller space, but it's good for like knots connections. If you want to learn how to do like a an FG knot or a bimini, or just to see how like you know a wind on leader is attached. I mean, there's a lot of guys who don't know these fundamentals that that you know, should. And, and it's hard to learn them online. Yeah. You can go on YouTube and, and, and watch videos, but until you're doing it like hands-on with like someone instructing you right there, it's, it's night and day. Even just righty versus lefty shit and watching someone do that, trying to explain oh, that, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like with Ben. Totally. Like Ben mate on one of our boats, he does everything backwards mm -hmm. and you go to like, like you go to undo a weight from a rubber band you might as well just cut it with a pair of scissors. Yeah, you want to uncoil off. a leader off the off the guide. It's yep. gonna be. It's gonna have opposite. a hitch in it because he's fucking coils everything the opposite way. Everything's That's so opposite. So funny. <laughs> yeah. Twisting knots. Everything's it's opposite. strong. He does it's a like great a, job. It's like a fishing dyslexia. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. It is. That's cool. Yeah. So good for him. But yeah, one thing I would I would say with that seminar is, you always learn something. You always meet cool people to network with during the True. fishing it's a great networking yeah. place because a lot of vendors are there and if you're just starting out it is like the best oh master class if you want to call it that for, oh, yeah. for this cheapest. type of shit and the cheapest oh yeah yeah you know? for what you get it's it's it is it's it's oh, yeah. very economical i yep. mean and and the thing is like even for intermediate guys who have been you know in the game for a while i mean let's face it you know like if you want to catch a giant tuna right now it's not like rocket science technology yeah. to catch a giant tuna but there's a lot of things that guys don't know about like like 
in, you know, the inshore fishery and what's happening and like how to fish the draggers. Like we've been doing that. like that. That's a topic that that is going to be more and more popular. But people have to realize, too, like fishing. I know we mentioned it a little bit. Um, people fishing around the draggers have to realize that there's a way to do it. and There's a way not to do it. And there are things you don't do. Mm-hmm. Like you got to know about like how their trawl works and like how to communicate with them and call them on 16. Find out when they're hauling back because... To try to fish with, you know, next to a dragger that's actually working, that's got the trawl in the water, it's dangerous. And and people don't realize those trawls, they hang way behind the boat. And then when they are pulling up, there's a lot of floating debris that comes up before that trawl actually gets pulled on, on board. And if you're back there, like, trying to mark fish and, and you know, throw bombs, chum in the water, you're going to, you know, you risk getting caught up in their gear. And, and there was a couple of incidents, no... You know, people got actually messed up, like physically, but like there were some close calls out there. When I was out there, we, we the VHF was got a little heated. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> on Channel 68. I'm sure. Yeah, the draggers figured out a lot of guys were on 68, and and uh, yeah, and you can't blame them. You know, most of the guys, most of them are good guys, but there are some that are like, just keep the fuck away from me at all times. Like, yeah, I've I've had guys come right out of their wheelhouse and just eat. all I see is their hands, and I know when they're doing this that they're like basically telling me to get the fuck out of there. And I'm just like, okay, yeah. stay away from this guy. Yeah. We learned a lot about etiquette and those types of situations up in Canada with the herring boats. Yeah, that must be very it's, it's like that, but it's even tighter quarters. And it's all fixed gear, too. And you got those those gill nets in the water. Yeah. you know, That's everywhere. It's fucking insane. When that shit's on, it is... As far as how to fight fish and maneuvering a boat and all that, I mean, there's really no better crash course than doing that. I will say, if you're if you are fishing near a dragger, this is a good piece of information that I learned the hard way. Um, if you do get caught up in the gear, like sometimes we'll be fighting fish, and in a dragger fleet, there's usually more than one dragger, and the fish love to go into another boat's gear mm. while you're fighting them especially when you're stretched out and and it's not like you can call another dragger and be like hey man i'm all stretched out <laughs> yeah. your trawl yeah. <laughs> you're gonna get shot so anyways i'm like it, it, so we had a couple of fish go into the gear and and um and you just free spool it you know palm on the spool obviously you know with the glove on and uh and just f- put it in free spool and let the fish get out of there yeah you know other other than that you're you know you're done no, yep. but so that's happened, and I know they do that up up in Canada. Yeah, we would basically like you'd be on, but the fish wouldn't know it was on, and then you would give it to them at the most. Not it didn't always work out. It doesn't always work out in your favor, but they eat the bait, and then you wouldn't put pressure on them until you're like, I want him to know he's hooked now, so he runs this way. Right? You know? Yeah, because so they're just circling. The they're net. just sitting, yeah, sitting on that net, you know, eating stuff, right. you know, floating out of it, coming out of it. I think that the whiting boats in the bay, they have to have fish on them, I know. you know, because I, I remember fishing. I, I didn't even fish the bay this year. I think I did like two. I, I talked to you one of the days. Yeah. When that I was that tournament. That was day. Oh, that sucked. That was a sucky day. I feel like I chose the two slowest days. That was <laughs> like, it was I really pretty did. damn good for several days prior to that. And then yeah. that day, I think the water temperature went up six degrees in 24 hours or some shit. It was bluebird, yeah. sunny, like horrible conditions for the yeah. day. Yeah. Flat calm. Sunny, no drift. You're no just sitting drift. there like oh. oscillating all day. It's my nightmare. Walking pogies around. Oh the my all god! Yes, <laughs> <Probably> chew <laughs> exactly. glass. And then, you, then once in a while, you look out. You're like, "What's that on the surface?" And you realize it's your pogie. And it's like sideways, like <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. And it's just like nothing is going to eat. It's funny you say that because I feel like they do behave a lot better when there's a little bit of chop. They stay down. One hundred percent. I I think the pogies like, I think. The, every all the fish just get bored and lazy man yeah and when it's co- flat calm and like when there's a little chop i feel like the the game the predators are more alert and they're 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 working and i feel like because of that the prey the pogies the bait are more active yeah because I, I i'm with you 100 percent on that those those doldrum days the baits are just like Whoa, mm-hmm. you know they want to escape down which like seems crazy because you're catching them in shallow water to go use them in deep water but that's their natural escape mechanism, like a herring. Yeah. You know? They're weird fish. They are. Extremely Pogies? weird baits. That's the weirdest oh, fish. Yeah. 
You know, know what's, you know what's funny? We didn't, not funny, it was horrible. We didn't have, <laughs> we didn't have pogies this year in my harbor. Like for the first year in 30 years, Rob West and I were not able to get pogies after like July 4th. They were gone. It was crazy. I've never seen that in my life. I mean, I know Plymouth was stacked with them. I'm sure Situ had had them. Well, we were not really. We didn't no? have them great at all. Huh. We had uh, we had like Plymouth. one Couple week. random days. One week that they were like pretty heavy, a little bit offshore that we ran into them. But they, they moved north quick. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. They're in Boston. Decent. Now, do you guys get that ones, bass right? run? And then the bigger ones came like in the fall. I yeah. feel like the, the bait size increased up in Boston a little bit. Our bass fishing was insane. I, the, I heard. The North River, which is where we... Yeah. There's going to be like 8 million boats in the North River next year because of all the time. But, but like, put it into perspective. We've been fishing there our whole lives. Yeah. And this past season was the most fucking crazy shit I've ever seen. Yeah. It was like hooking whole tuna mackerels through the lips dead, just hits the surface, 40 incher. 42. Yeah, it was nuts. Slot, 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 35, 45. Yeah. Wow. Was, not every day. But there were some but days. A lot of awesome. days. Like any day that it was windy. Yeah. <sighs> Overcast, windy. It was nuts. It was really good. That's cool. I mean, that's that's good to see, though, because there's been a lot of controversy on the on the fish stocks with mm. the bass. And so that's good. to. When we were shad fishing in May. Guys were catching stripers up in the fresh at the Indian Head, like, that I don't know if you you probably crossed it coming from Situate. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Not yeah. far from that With little bridge right there. Three A bridge there. Yeah, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. Three the three bridge, mm-hmm. the Route Three bridge. Yeah. But this estu- this part of it right here where you cross at Myats at the red store there. Yeah. Not very far from there. Guys no are kidding. catching bass. Wow. Yeah. There was it's herring. Pretty cool up the there. way they can awesome. survive in that that brackish water. It really is. Yeah, we didn't see any pogies. It was weird. I mean, we just didn't. and it sucks because they're a great hardy bait. That's what I love about a pogie. Like the, uh, for a kite bait, like they'll last all fucking day. Oh yeah, mm. you know. Yep. Um, let's change it up a little bit. So your book. I've been reading some of the excerpts on social media. <laughs> I you're a really really good writer. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I you know I screw around with it. It's it's. Uh, I don't even know. It's it's like you never know how good anything is artistically until you put it out there, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been I've been working on it. I've been trying to get it every year. I say it's going to be done this year, and I've been saying that for five. So hopefully this coming year I'm I'll be done with it because I I got about fifteen stories that I'm trying to fit to finish. So it'll be like an anthology of like a bunch of crazy shit that happened. That's awesome. To us I can't wait water. to read it. I finished uh, Skip Smith's The Madam and the Hooker when I was in Florida. And I've been reading uh, Kenton's book, Vicious Cycle. I'm like 50 to 100 pages into that. Nice. But um, yeah, I'm excited to read it. Nice. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to write it. I'll tell you, I, I, I would, what I'd love to do is my girlfriend's a good writer. She's, she's, you know, published author and bestseller actually, but um, she. How did I not know that? Yeah. She podcast. She, she has a podcast. She too, well, she? she dabbled in it. She dabbled. does. She does. She she she's just started a podcast. But but no, she's written books that have been bestsellers. She's she wrote a, a book called Whitey on Trial because she worked on the Whitey Bulger trials. She, she she's an attorney, um, and she worked with the you know as an assistant to the DA during that whole like Whitey Bulger thing and uh, trial. And so she wrote a book on basically a profiling of like the the. The story, like the, the the courtroom story, from start to finish, like all right, you know, Whitey walked in and he stared down at the witness, and then he, you know, like everything that happened in the courtroom. It's kind of a cool read, um, but anyway, she's helped me a lot. She's like told me like what I need to work on, what I don't need to work on, and it's mostly what I do need to work. On. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's fine. I like to write. I mean, it, it's a great way to kill some time and and uh, and do it you know productively and. And I have a lot of shit that I that I'm gonna forget eventually. Yeah. So I might as well get it down on paper. And we've seen some crazy stuff out there. I mean, you know, I don't know. I think if you if you're on the water enough, you just it's gonna happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure For you sure. guys have tons of stories. You know, and the lessons learned through stories, other people's stories, I think is is some of the best stuff you can get from you know, reading things like that or even going to the seminar, just hearing experiences from people that have put exponentially more time on the water than you 
it just helps you figure out certain situations. Yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely. And and it's nice to hear stories that you can relate to because a lot of people have, you know, like we got hit by lightning and I'm sure a lot of other people got hit by lightning or, or you know, or I mean, I bought a house from a guy who owns a lobstering business offshore. I don't know if you guys remember the, the TV show Lobster Wars. It was kind of a spinoff of, yeah. mm. of Deadliest Catch, except it was lobster fishermen. And um, anyways, uh, this, you know, this guy had, had a, lost a crew member. And, um, you know, talk, and there was a story written about it called Fatal Forecast. Yeah. Um, yep. Great book. And, and, you know, bottom line is, though, like, you know, that's next level, like, I, you know, Thank God I haven't lost a crew member. I've, I've thought about killing them a few times myself. Like my, <laughs> but Hopefully you don't I, lose one now. They, they've thought about <laughs> killing me too, I'm sure. I purposely lost uh, one, but never accidentally lost yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Not due to weather. We did lose one, and then we went and picked them up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, it, it, I mean, some, some of the stuff gets crazy. But, like, th there's one story, though, in particular. Like, you, you guys know Archie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, obviously. So Archie came to the seminar and, and actually did a really cool presentation on, like, the history of fishing and, and just, like, how the fisheries changed from, like, 20 years ago, even 50 years ago till now. Because he was fishing in, like, the, you know, 50s, Using 60s, lobsters for giant 70s. tunas. You, you get, using lobsters <laughs> for giant tunas like, ah, with elastic band. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, I know. It's crazy. And, like, he, it's funny. To, and when he got up there and talked, like, you know, the next gen, or even two gen or three generations, with, with guys were just sitting there. A lot of them didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. you know. And they're just like, holy shit, like, look at that picture. And there were, like, these old pictures of, like, shit, like, right out of, like, the 70s. Like, mm -hmm. just the fashion to the sideburn chops, and, you know. And, and like, slob fish hanging behind slob them. Slob fish. Yep. Yep. I'm amazed at how many big fish were caught on gear they had hand back lines. then. On hand lines and stuff. Lot Silly. Of, yeah. I don't even like harpoon lines. Even just the looking whole at, fight on hand lines. Looking at the raw and reel setups from back then till now, it's like yeah, yeah. A <laughs> lot of dead. cloth line that didn't even have mono. Mm -hmm. It was just cloth line. Like it, I mean, the, maybe the fish were just dumb back then. I don't know. Who knows? Or we're just overthinking. <laughs> now I'm out there with like 130 fluorocarbon, yeah. hooking fucking 800 pounds, angel and hair, and then pop. Yeah, exactly. After four hours. Yeah. Uh, oh, fucking brutal. But yeah, the the, uh, the stories are cool because you know it it's fun to share them and and it's fun to you know you, all of a sudden you tell a story and there's like six people that are like holy shit that happened to me. Like I'm, I wrote a story about a, a, a fucking ghost ship that that I, I mean I don't know if it was a ghost ship but. It was in the dark. I won't say too much, but we, we, we passed a tall ship that had no running lights, like no fucking lights on it. Not a, not a mass light, not a running light, like no sign of life and just went by us. And I, and I had to make the decision, do I follow this thing until the sunrise to see what the fuck's going on or do I go fishing? Because, yeah. you know, you miss the morning bite. If I follow that thing and it was headed in, yeah, anyways, yeah. So yeah, story don't for another time. Don't spoil Because now I want to read it. Yeah. <laughs> But Archie, but my point is, I told Archie the story, and Archie said, you know, we were in a very, we were in this very close to that area with him and Linda Greenlaw, and they were coming in from from a sword trip, and they saw a similar. It's insane. Wow. Yeah. A lot to be learned from people, and I put a lot of time out on the water. That's it. If you put the time in, you just you're gonna you're gonna mm -hmm. see it. Yep. You know. Um, I remember reading a story real quick about a, a guy that was cast netting. It was in like salt. I don't know if you remember like saltwater sportsman had a story at the back of the magazine yeah. every every episode, every issue, and and this guy was like cast netting for mullet, and it was like in the dark and he was going tarp and fishing and he threw on a school of mullet and all of a sudden like, the fucking net just went flying and he got pulled off his boat, and the net the line caught his leg and was like pulling him backwards. So he's underwater, like trying to reach, doing like 10 miles an hour, trying to reach for his foot to get the line to, to untangle it. And he got pulled up on it with sandbar that where he was shallow enough where he could like bounce his way and catch his breath. And he saw this giant ray. Holy fucking shit. doing wow. like cartwheels <laughs> in the dark. He was like imagine. attached involuntarily. <laughs> That's voluntarily awesome. attached to this fucking stingray oh trying to drown him anyways yeah that's like involuntary aquaman shit yeah it is. you know yeah that's crazy um speaking of crazy new adventures you're heading on one 
Yes. In a couple of days. Headed to the Maldives. Never been. I didn't even know where the F the Maldives were until a few months ago. Can you give I, us like a general geographic location? The Maldives. I don't know if I could show you right now. They're in the Indian Ocean. They're, okay. like, yeah. they're like 200 miles south of the southernmost tip of India. And uh, there's, there's, eight, there's like 1,800 islands. And the scientists are saying, my, my son brought this up the other day. He's like, yeah, it's all going to be underwater in a couple hundred years. So they're just basically boomerangs of sand in the middle of like the Indian Ocean. So they're, they're, they're not high off the sea level, but um, they're all sand-based islands that are developed. Most of them have resorts on them. I think there's like 1,400 resorts. It's crazy. It's so it's a it's a big desti- resort destination for like Europe and Australia, <clears throat> India, and um, it's a, it's a long it's a long flight. We 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 connect through uh, Istanbul in Turkey. I think there's like an eleven hour flight to Istanbul out of Logan, and then you fly from Turkey down to the Maldives. Another like nine hour flight. So it's a lot of flying, but um, it's only like a thousand bucks which isn't bad for that yeah. long of a journey. That's a nuts. It's not bad. It's, it, you know, maybe 1,200. Um, and then once you get there, you can, it's the island of Mali. That's the capital island of the Maldives. You can fish right from Mali. There's a, there's a slew of charter operations, or you can take like a little propeller plane and, and, there's, and there's like, I don't know, 18 or 20 different little airports, like domestic airports that you can fly into. And that's what we're doing. We're going to this island of Kudu. It's like K. O O D D O O, and there's a resort on there called the Makir. Um, I think it's Makir Kudu, and uh, and we're fishing with a guy, Outcast Sport Fishing. Now, this is all new stuff. Like I haven't fished with these guys. Obviously, I don't even know who the hell they are. Other than on Recommendation what's, WhatsApp, or you... no WhatsApp, oh. just calling people, uh, texting people oh. on WhatsApp. Oh. That's I I literally spent you know days reaching out to a lot of different guys. And this guy seems pretty legit. There, there's a couple of uh, operations that we're fishing with. There's another operation that's, um, I can't even remember the name of it. Um, but anyways, I'll have a lot more information once we're back, obviously. Hopefully some fish picks. But um, the fishing is is outstanding from what I understand. It's all like, I mean, the multitude of species you get there is crazy. Like you get dog tube tuna, like three different types of grouper, three different types of snapper, uh, wahoo, or swimming around like bluefish. Um, you get, you know, marlin if you want. I'm, I'm going for the jig and pop thing just because I love doing that. I don't get a chance to really do that much here. Um, but, you know, big yellowfin on the top. I'd love to get a dog tube tuna. Those things are fucking nasty. Like, they are. They are just so Would that complete the, prehistoric uh, looking. I'm assuming that would complete every tuna in the ocean for you. Oh shit! I don't know. Let's see. Well, um, it has to have. No, I've never caught. Have a, you guys saw them? I've never caught a blackfin. No shit. Yeah, no way. Oh no shit! <laughs> don't tell anybody, <laughs> dude. That's wild. Yeah, never caught. A, never even fished for blackfin. Wow. Yeah, I've never gone. I've never gone up to the shrimp boats. That one's kind of easy. Fin. That one's fairly easy. Yeah, though. I feel yeah. like get the dog tooth done. <laughs> you know what? It'll probably take you ten years to get right. your blackfin. Though. Yeah, you know what's funny? I, I was fishing with Frank Pitton last month. And I think we had a black fin on. Yeah. And fucking got eaten by a shark. <laughs> uh, I got I got knocked out of that one. Um, but they're they're catching a lot of black fin down off of Palm Beach and stuff, you know. Especially like in the spring. I love catching those things. Springtime's good. Though. But that's that's sick. Dog tooth is Dog tooth, you know, and, and, and the thing is I guess you go through a lot of gear. Like you just you, like nine out of ten fish break off. Really? They go yeah. into the reef or they just bite you off. Yeah. So you you I'm bringing like 20 pounds of nomad jigs, yeah. you know. Um, but it's, it's the fishery just looks so cool. Like the GTs, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen footage of like the GT surface action, but like that's a popping, like, you know, dream just catching those things. And they're big fucking jacks. They're like 60, 80 pounders, Sick. you know? Yeah. So I there's a lot of jacks all day. Jack yeah, Rebels, Kermit. They're fun. I love all that stuff. They're I'm just fun. glad they don't get as big as Bluefin. Yeah. Like imagine like a 400 pound GT. AJ? Or oh my an Amberjack. God. Or an MJ. Just wreaking havoc. Yeah. They'd break everything. They yeah. would break everything, mm. including your boat if you tried to, tried to bring them in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But like they, they, yeah, even in Columbia, we were catching big ones um, while we were like cast, you know, catching bait. I would like throw poppers around, you know, inshore and we catch these 
a, you know, big, like 30 pound jacks. And they'd hit like a fucking freight train. They really, they'd, they'd hit harder than a tuna sometimes. That's cool. You know? So yeah, looking forward to that. We're going to be fishing like seven days. And uh, so I'm doing a talk at the, on the, at the seminar on like places that I would recommend traveling that I've been to, like Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, um, Maldives, Mexico. I'm going to Mexico right after this Maldives trip to fish with a buddy of mine who's got a charter operation down in Puerto Vallarta. Um, it's called Arechos Sport Fishing, and he's actually the one that's donating a, a, a trip to... Oh, that's cool. A lucky ticket holder at the seminar. Nice. You got to get your tickets before. I don't know when this is going to air, but it, they got to get it before January twentieth. But anyways, there'll be a every this year we. This do should it. actually probably be up before that. Oh, okay, so. cool. Yeah. Well, if, then get your tickets, guys. If you know you're going, because uh, we're giving away a Simrad chart plot or two. That those are like two door prizes that we're giving away for just the early guys that that register by the twentieth. But um, we're gonna fish in Puerto Vallarta. Um, He's got a, uh, a 32 CV, I believe. And uh, we, um, we're going to fish overnight at the Marias. So the Maria Islands are like an island chain that's about 100 miles like northwest of the coast of Puerto Vallarta. And it's like a Mexican Alcatraz out there. So they, there's like a prison island. So you're not allowed to get close to the island, which is where the fish are. So you got to be really careful because the Navy will come after you. And, and if you get caught... You spend some time on the island. Wow. Passports nice. get looked at, calls to the embassy, the whole nine yards. So you got to be careful. Um, and we've been chased out of there a, a lot of times. One time we were, fi- we were catching a, we were, ho- we were fighting a big yellow fin in the dark. We had hooked it during the day and the captain was like, turn out all the lights. You know, the American captains don't even fish down there. It's just because they don't want to deal with the bullshit. But yeah. the, 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 there are Mexican captains that still do it that I think pay people maybe to, to keep eyes out or they know people or whatever and they're, they're allowed in there certain times but you're never fully safe and so we were fighting this fish and like uh the navy like launched a boat while we were fighting the oh, fish shit. and they were getting closer and closer and close because we were like six miles off land and we got the fish like just in time and then we just beelined it out of there into the Amazing. you know into, out into the darkness but uh anyways that that's a fun trip too so for anyone who's interested in like big yellowfin like those are the big you know, the big dogs, big 300 pounders. That's cool. Those fish, you know, they're Oof. fucking huge. I hope you get a dog tooth. I would love to get a dog tooth tuna. You'll get one. I hope so, man. I hope so. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm bringing down a bunch of Rons because I bet you the Rons oh, yeah. would just get crushed down there. Again, the problem with the Rons is you got to bring about 80 tails. Yeah, no shit. Because they're just going to get destroyed. I brought, it's funny, I went to the Galapagos one time, like seven years ago, and I brought like three Rons with me. I had like, you know, an assortment of shit, and, and I hadn't really used the Rons that much. And we were casting, and we were getting bit on poppers, but then sometimes the fish would go down, and it's like, and I was with like Larry Backman and, and uh, a couple other guys, and, and Larry started jigging with metal. And he was hooking fish with the jigs. And I was like, ah, I didn't really bring any jigs. So I got these rons down. So I started throwing the rons. And I remember we had a school of fish like sitting under the boat. And I like did a lob cast. And the thing was just on the drop. And all of a sudden it was like. <sighs> and I like locked the bail. And I was like. <laughs> Sick. Every fucking drop in the Galapagos like a rons gets eaten. Sick. It's just insane. That's how many fish are over there. It's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. But it's funny because they were, you know, you weren't getting them on the top. And it yeah. was like, oh, they're gone, you know, the, the bite died, but nope, they were down there. And so the rons are really effective. It's just a matter of bringing enough to get you through the trip. What are some other, like, must-have things you always bring? So definitely the rons. I bring a multitude of different size jig heads, too. They, they make a bunch. Um, and they have, like, some new ones, too, that came out last year, prototypes that I that I strongly suggest. They're, like, shorter. You know how everyone knows the rons like the eight inch tail or nine inch yeah. tail with the five f- three in three ounce or five ounce head they also have like these shorter versions they're like paddle tails almost um mm. and those are great for like just vertical stuff because they they sink you know quicker um and or you can just cast them and just kind of do a slow reel where because the the wrong i do love the ron's tails the traditional ones because they kind of bounce all and over the place around. they dart around i think they look more like a squid everyone thinks a sand eel but like 
I honestly, you know, you've seen yeah, squid you move tr- around. Tr- yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I really do. I think they replicate squid. Sense. But anyways, I would bring those. I'd bring a bunch of poppers. I, I like the nomads, but the halcos work. Um, uh, definitely some poppers. I would bring uh, definitely a bunch of metal. I like the streaker jigs. Um, you know, Nomad, Shimano have a bunch. I mean, there's a million different jigs out there, but like the butterfly jigs, definitely bring those. Um, and again, this is for like the, the jig and pop stuff, which we're going to do. We're not going to really troll out there. And then I bring a bunch of sabikis because, and then some live bait hooks. I get a bunch of Charlie Browns, different sizes, like sevens right up to like tens. Um, just because, you know, if we do catch some blue runners on the sabikis oh yeah why the hell not live line yeah you know and a lot of times you'll find that these charter outfits don't fish live bait but then you bring sabiki rigs and they have a live well and you and you you know you're at the dock catching blue runners and it's like hey man can can we take a few of these and they're like holy shit where'd you get those yeah you know i mean sabiki rigs are a must-have you got to bring them everywhere they really are yep so bring sabikis uh what else um makes sense it's all easy packable stuff i mean aside from weight with the leads but like you just kind of manage that depending on how long your trip's gonna be but but to your point like trolling to bring trolling shit on a trip that's a different holy fuck that's like a hockey bag (laughs) it's hard yeah Yeah. no it's it's um that's really all you need honestly and you know some line obviously bring you know some backing i usually bring like 80 a spool of a small spool of like 80 and a, another spool of 100. Yeah. Are you bringing like extra spools, like actual real spools as yes. well, already spooled up? Oh, no, I don't bring. That's a good idea to do. I, I don't do it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're going through customs, um, especially if you're bringing a rod tube, like mine's the old like uh, uh, Plano, like bazooka tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that thing raises eyebrows when you go through <laughs> customs. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have, I have like old people still like, is that a weapon? Uh, is that a gun? It's gonna check people, my RPG. Real people quick. suck. Yeah, I and, and so the other thing is they 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 love to take line off your. So if you do make the mistake of bringing a spool on your carry on, fifty percent of the time they'll make you take the line off. No way. It sucks. Oh yeah, it happened to me coming back from the Galapagos, and Larry filmed it and posted it on Facebook. Like sucks to be David. Right now. <laughs> and like and and they're sitting there like just you know. <laughs> Oh. And meanwhile, there's like a line of people behind me. Like, this is a true story. And I'm like, do you want me to like get a, do you have like a cutting utensil? And, and, and I'm like, I didn't check and it wasn't trying to carry a knife on. Otherwise, I, I would have just went like, Psh. yeah. But I had that would have been there. a little alarming in security <laughs> with yeah. on a switch plate. I, 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 I got just the tool for that. Another, another, <laughs> another time I tried like an idiot, like 20 years ago, I brought a fucking pair of crimpers on my carry-on. <laughs> and the, and the, the woman's like going through the bag and she like picks the crimpers up. And it was like... <laughs> And my buddy, Doug's, and shit. my buddy Doug's behind me and he's laughing. He's like, you fucking idiot. And I'm like, we need these. And I was like, literally, I was begging with the woman. I'm like, they're for understand. Pesca. It's for Pesca. She's like, no, senor. I'm like, fuck. Lost a nice pair of swags. But Holy yeah, you got to be careful going through the, the customs cause with the line. You know, I don't know why. It's stupid. So. I mean, what lead is just as bad. Yeah, I brought been, a bunch of lead eggs. You've been sinkers. pulled over a few times. Yeah, I've had like full dredges of like dredge baits with leads in them. Oh, really? In in carry-ons, and they don't like. Lead. And they look like bullets. Oh, yeah, they look like interesting. Bullets. So like immediately they're pulling those things apart. And they're like, what the hell are these? And they've never taken them from me, but I've had like you know bags of eighty baits. With you know what? Leads though? in the heads. It's it's guys like us doing that shit though that have like made that we kind of paved the way a little bit because i i feel like there are new people that 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 go in the machine look in the machine and they see a bunch of eyes looking at them and they're like what the fuck is that and then they and then you're like pesca you know I, and that's the other thing i gotta learn spanish it's kind of ridiculous that i travel all these places in central america and can't speak a lick of fucking spanish but like you know we they open the bag and it's like all these, you know there's lure heads like especially trolling you know you have all your marlin lures and there's yeah. like all these heads with big plastic eyeballs yeah, lead yeah. inserts too lead inserts and yeah that's i didn't that's a good point about the lead hmm. i had a drone confiscated when i was in nicaragua i like going in um the this like really pretty like you know customs girl was like 
She's like, oh, hola, hola. I'm like, hey, how you doing? And then she's like, ah, no drone day. And I'm like, what? She's <laughs> like, yeah, she's like, uh, don't day, you're, you're drone. I was like, well, well, yeah, here's my drone. Yeah. And she's like, no. And she points to this like dilapidated poster on the wall that looked like it had been there for like a decade. And it was like, it had like, it said drone and it had a, like a line through it. <laughs> And I was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> fucking drone gone. <laughs> no, went to, uh, went to went to like some like politician's kid. Oh, oh yeah, 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 sure. Yep, politician's Christmas yep. present. <laughs> No, I called the embassy. I was so mad that night. I was in a bad mood. I called the embassy and the guy laughed. He's like, dude, he's like, and there was a guy next to me that had like a case of wine that he was bringing and, and they took that and he was like right next to me. He's like, this is fucking bullshit. And like, I, and I was like, dude, he was getting so upset. I was like, we're both going to jail. Yeah, and I didn't yeah. want to go to jail in Nicaragua. And then there was like a revolution there like a month later. So oh, because the buddy, drone. No like, drone. Right, no no drone. drone. Right. My buddy. My buddy is like, "You're. We're so lucky. We get the fuck out of there when we did." It was. It was like a big civil unrest, like yeah. civil uprising. But uh, anyways, Shit. yeah, customs can be a treat. Uh, mm. You know what I got was global entry, which was nice for for traveling like um, abroad. Just to cut line. It's like a passport upgrade or it's, something. It's it's just it allows you to to uh, I mean you go through this interview process and they you know and, and and but it's it's worth it if you're doing a lot of like international travel. Mm. Yep. So that's cool. Well, good luck on your trip. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. man. I'm excited well, to I hear have about some it. Stories. I'm going to do a March. a talk about it at the seminar. So I'll uh, I'll sh- I should have some good um some good footage. It's awesome. Yeah. I'll probably catch a black fin over there. <laughs> first cast yeah <laughs> you know, here's, a, here's a fucked up story real quick so i grew up on a pond called spy pond in arlington and you know a lot of freshwater fishing as a kid and, and uh one species that didn't live in that pond was crappy calico bass whatever you call them you know never saw one i grew up there fished there for like 18 years for for i you know started really stopped fishing there and um i'm out there with my brother and my buddy bob and Bob really doesn't like to fish. I used to keep him out in the rain and like he, to the point where he's like, I'll never fish with you again. <laughs> and, and so like, he was like, dude, he's like, you guys ever catch, you guys ever catch calico bass in here? And my brother and I look at each other like, no, like, is that a like, crappy? What the f- calico? I'm like, no. The fucking barber's like, right. And he, he hooks the fish and he reels it in. I shit you not. It was a fucking crappy. It was a calico bass. It was the only one I've ever seen, and it was the only one that ever came out of that pond, and it was right after he asked us that. That is a true story. That's fucking crazy. That is a true story. That's usually how that shit goes, though. Yeah. Some yeah. poor bird dropped it in there. Like, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, morning, yeah. You know? Exactly. Right. What is this thing? Oh. Came from the next town over. <laughs> well, that was great, boys. We uh, yeah, fun. just shy of the two-hour mark. It's always easy peasy with you. Appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you having me. Um, Enjoy doing these. It's fun. Good luck in your travels. Hope you get a dog Thanks. tooth. Looking forward to the seminar. March yep. 2nd and 3rd, Marriott, Quincy. Yep. Be there, be square. Castafari.com slash. Fo- forward slash forward fishing. Slash. Oh, fishing <laughs> <seminar>. <laughs> com forward slash fishing hyphen seminar. But the, the website is on, the seminar website is on the Castafari homepage. So if you just go to Castafari.com, cool. um, you can get to it there. Yep. And, uh. We'll be there. It'll be fun. Yeah, looking forward to that workshop. Yeah, I'm too. It'll be cool. Yeah. It'll be good. We got to talk about bait procurement. I know we have some, but I have some just to get our stars aligned. Nice. Um, I got. Uh, we got mackerel. Uh, we'll have mackerel on hand. We'll have herring on hand. We'll have butterfish. Um, squids. I'm plenty assuming. of mackerel. Yep, plenty of squid. Um, you know what we're gonna. You know we're gonna do this year too. We're gonna. Uh, I don't know. Have you guys heard about the, 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 big squid tentacles for swords? Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna get a hold of some of those because those things apparently are like the next level. An octop- is it Octop- octopus. Is it octopus tentacles? Yeah. O- yeah well, octopus. it's octopus tentacles or the big humbelt squid yeah. tentacles. Bottom line is, if I have to go to Chinatown and, and chop one up, I will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> they make those things suck. Right out of alien. Don't alien. worry. The next step is <laughs> don't uh, take this off my face. <laughs> uh, well, thanks again. Cool. Appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll catch up with you in the next couple months. Awesome. 
Uh, we will end this one on our father's three words of fishing wisdom. Remember, you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last one, you'll have to keep listening. Stay tight, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Sea Rose Fishing Podcast. If you'd like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date on all the latest Sea Bros Fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, to book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit massbayguides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following Mass Bay Guides on Instagram and Facebook.